The story is about a guy who wakes up in a strange place where nothing is around. He doesn't know who he is or where he is and wonders why his hands are cuffed. He decides to look around, but he doesn't know which way to go, so he keeps walking in a random direction. But after some while, he reaches nowhere and gets tired. Suddenly, he sees something in that place from afar and runs towards it, but he gets terrified to see a woman's dead body lying there and thinks who killed her. Suddenly, a switch flipped within him and his horror was gone. Meanwhile, a guy arrives and asks the boy if he did that, but when he denies it, the man agrees because the woman's chest is ripped open and the boy can't do that with his bare hands. When the boy asks the man if he knows where they are, the other guy replies he doesn't know and doesn't even know his name. When the boys ask the guy how he got his chains off, the guy tells him he doesn't have any, but suddenly, participants identifiers fall from the sky. The boy grabs one of the papers and sees that the name Rian Asura is written on it with the information that the 19-year-old boy is looking for his older sister, so the boy wonders if it is him. Simultaneously, the other guy's paper in which his name is written is Tenjin Chu, a 35-year-old who has a wife and three kids, but that guy is shocked to read this because he doesn't remember anything. Suddenly, the system gives them their weapons and announces that they have five minutes to execute their opponent. Rian and Tenjin are shocked to see their weapons, and the system announces that if they fail, their suits will release an electric shock, which will kill them, and the system welcomes them to the god game. Rian and Tenjin are still in shock, but round one begins. Rian tells Tenjin that they are not sure if these are their names and backgrounds, and all of this could be fake, but Tenjin says it's not a prank because the corpse of the girl is as real as it can be. Tenjin asks if Rian thinks someone could wipe their memories as part of a joke and the suits they wear, which they cannot take off. When Tenjin believes right now, this background is all he knows, and he has a family he must live for. But Rian is a boy he just met in this hell, who is nothing to him. Rian realizes Tenjin has made up his mind, and when Tenjin runs to attack, somehow, Rian can see his attack. Suddenly, he sees a light on Tenjin's body and hears a voice that tells him to kill him. Rian doesn't want to hurt anyone, but when Tenjin doesn't hesitate and stabs his leg, Rian stabs him back with his blade but falls. Rian thinks if he can free his hands, he might have a chance to save his life, but suddenly, Tenjin throws his dagger, which stabs his shoulder. Tenjin picks up Rian's blade and says it's lucky for him that Rian's hands are bound. Rian could have killed Tenjin before, but he can't understand why he hesitated. Suddenly, he sees the light at Tenjin's neck, and when his inner voice asks him what he is waiting for, he suddenly gets up and stabs Tenjin's neck. Rian, without hesitation, with the chain, his hands cuffed, chokes Tenjin and kills him. For some reason, when Rian killed this man, he felt nothing because he did what he needed to, and now he needs answers to make the person putting them through this hell pay. Suddenly, he hears participant 305,081 Rian Asura is the victor. When the person behind the voice appears and says he is the god, Rian gets shocked, but when the god asks how he feels, Rian pauses for a while, and then says he feels good and alive. God says it's amusing because his mind speaks a different truth than his heart, and when Rian asks what place this is, God tells him it's a realm he created specially for the game, and two million souls were imported into this round. When Rian yells why he can't remember anything, God says two million souls, one game, and one wish, but Rian can't understand what God is saying. God chokes him to stop him from interrupting, makes him kneel with his power, and says he will spare one wish to the victor of the god game, and upon the cadavers of millions, only one will remain to claim it while the rest will perish. When Rian yells why he would do that, God replies that it's entertainment for him and others, and the further Rian progresses, the more he'll discover about God and himself. After saying, for now, Rian has to survive. God disappears, and suddenly, Rian finds himself in a place where other players are present. Rian sees a kid there and wonders if everyone had to kill someone to get there, but suddenly, he feels his wounds disappear, and his chains are gone. Rian sees a gate there, which is for entering round two with a partner, and he knows in a game of survival, everyone will pick out weaklings, so he needs to make them think twice about targeting him. Rian goes to the information desk, where a robot asks if he is ready for the second round and says its name is Yora, the facilitator for the next round. When Rian yells at Yora about where they are, some guys nearby tell him that Yora won't tell this because they have already tried all the questions he is thinking, and one asks Rian what his story is. Rian believes they are targeting him, so he says he doesn't know and asks if that guy knows, but that guy replies he also doesn't know, and it seems God told them the same story. The boy introduces himself as Yoram, 
and he hopes they get through this together. But suddenly, Rian sees a light coming out of Euron's mouth and feels like he just got stabbed in the chest. Rian wonders if this guy is using some magic because it's been just the first round, and how could this guy know how to use such power? Suddenly, another guy arrives there, and when he tells Euron to stop, Euron replies he didn't even touch Rian. But that masked guy summons his sword and says pricks like Euron make him angry. Rian is shocked to see this guy, and Euron says he just wants to see if Rian is worthy of being his partner. But the masked guy tells Euron to ask one of his lackeys. The masked guy tells Rian that he'll be his partner, and Rian, seeing it as a good opportunity, introduces himself, and that guy says he is Takeda Shinjim. Takeda calls him to go for the next round, and when they enter the door, Rian sees it leads to the void. But suddenly, a path appears on which Shinjin starts walking. Rian follows Shinjin, and when he asks why Shinjin chose him, he replies that Rian's eyes are like gods, and if it means something, he wants Rian as his ally. When Rian asks if he chose him just for that, Shinjin replies everyone in this game is their enemy, and they are all competitors, and to break the barrier of enemies, he must take a leap of faith and put blind trust in someone, so he chose Rian. Shinjin says if Rian becomes deadweight or fails him, he'll cut him off, and Rian thinks this guy is too honest. Suddenly, they enter another door where they see their opponent is an old man and a girl, and Shinjin asks whom Rian wants to kill first. The old man asks if they know what this next round is about because he doesn't want to make any assumptions, but Shinjin warns them to take another step. When the old man asks their name, Shinjin stops Rian from telling, but the old man says his name is Jiren, and the girl is Sarah. Suddenly, Yura appears to explain the rules of the second round, and while showing them a ball, explains the possessor of the ball will win a point for their team for every second they hold it, and after 15 minutes, the team with the most points wins. The Yura says they can use any means necessary to claim the ball, and killing is allowed, however, if the ball falls off the platform, both teams lose. Suddenly, Sarah summons her weapon, and Rian gets offended because everyone knows how to summon their weapons instead of him. When Shinjin asks if God didn't tell Rian, he replies God refused most of his questions, and suddenly, Yora begins the game by throwing the ball down. The old man tries to grab it, but he falls because of its weight and immediately gets up, calling Yora stupid. Meanwhile, Shinjin directly runs to attack the old man but Sarah blocks his attack with her weapon. Meanwhile, Rian thinks Jiren is probably the weakest and is now holding the ball, so he rushes to attack him. But the old grabs his cane, which is his weapon, and attacks Rian by emitting fire from his cane. Suddenly, a light from Rian's eyes shows him the path from where he can kill the old man, but he has to sacrifice his arm. Rian, passing through the fire, immediately punches down the old man, and Shinjin is shocked to see this. Rian's arm is burnt, but he picks up the ball, and when the old man says his eyes are his power, Rian realizes he can see the paths of opportunity when he can overtake a foe, which is a natural killing instinct, and that is his power. Shinjin tells Rian to kill the old man, but Rian notices the violent path disappears, and suddenly, Sarah stabs Shinjin down by stabbing his shoulder with her arrow. Suddenly, Sarah runs to punch him, but Rian dodges her attack and realizes she is fast, so he has to get away from her. Suddenly, Jiren grabs his leg, and Sarah kicks his face. Rian immediately gets a hold of himself, but in a flash, Sarah gets close to him and punches him back. Rian wonders what he could have done to be in this hell, and here he is, searching for a sister he doesn't remember, fighting people he doesn't know, and for a prize he doesn't understand. Rian gets up while Jiren tells him to give up the ball. But suddenly, Shinjin gets up and takes out Sarah's arrow from his body while Sarah and Jiren are dealing with Rian. Meanwhile, Rian thinks he has to find his reason to live and find the truth. Suddenly, Rian jumps from the platform with the ball in his hands, but Sarah immediately grabs his foot and asks if he is trying to kill them all. Sarah pulls him up, and Rian asks them why they want to live, but Sarah gets furious at him. Suddenly, they hear Shinjin attacking Jiren, gets shocked to see it and Jiren apologizes to Sarah for letting his guard down. Shinjin tells Sarah that she should have finished him off, but Sarah furiously attacks him and starts pounding his face. Rian predicted this, so jumping off the platform forced Sarah and Jiren to focus on him so Shinjin could return to the fight. Suddenly, the old tells Rian that they don't have anything to fight for and no reason to live besides fear of death. But Rian asks if fear is enough to condone what they have done and what they'll do. Suddenly, Yora announces there are only three minutes left, and Rian realizes Sarah can't win because they have too many points, as he has possession of the ball all this time. Meanwhile, Shinjin also gets back on his feet and tells Sarah it's over, but when she asks if he wants her to kill herself, 
He replies this might be more painless than what God has for her. Sarah says it's true she lost in points, but she still has three minutes, so she instantly moves behind Regan to attack him. Regan notices when she moves fast, a gust always flows from her position as if she is its source, and somehow he can see her movements. Suddenly, Sarah hits his leg, making him fall on the ground, and is about to stab him. But Regan stops her attack with the ball, although the pressure cracks his ribs. Suddenly, Shinjin attacks Sarah, but she immediately moves away, and Regan gets up instantly. Regan tells Shinjin that Sarah controls the wind to temporarily enhance her speed, but suddenly, they see Sarah start crying and tell Yora that she doesn't want to die. Regan feels bad for her, but Shinjin reminds her that it's not over. Sarah says Jiren looks peaceful, but that is not what she seeks, and she gets ready to fight again. Meanwhile, Regan says her power and speed are strengthening, and when Shinjin asks how he knows, Regan replies he can see it. Regan can't understand how she got this strong, and suddenly Sarah, without them noticing, with a speed of flash, punches Regan back with great strength, making the ball fall from his hands, and throws her dagger towards him which stabs his shoulder. Sarah takes out her dagger and is going to stab Regan again to kill him, but suddenly, her aim is missed because her hand is cut off. Sarah furiously looks at Shinjin, and he says she made him use his power, but Sarah asks why he didn't use his power all along and waited until he now, to which he replies he didn't want Regan to know because, in games like these, it's best to keep the trump cards hidden. Sarah runs towards him to attack him, but Shinjin summons a huge fire, which injures Sarah's shoulder, and Regan is shocked. After killing Tenjin in the first round, he thought he was strong, but after witnessing Shinjin and Sarah, he understands there are far worse monsters in this game. Shinjin puts his blade on her shoulder, but Sarah yells she can't die in a game like this where a weak guy like Rian is going to live and says she doesn't even know who she is and her little brother is missing. Shinjin apologizes to her, but she requests him to find her brother, so he replies he will and cuts off her head. Yora starts clapping that they are the winners of this round, and suddenly, Rian's wounds start to heal. Shinjin is shocked Rian is smiling and asks if he is okay, to which Rian replies he is fine, and Shinjin says Rian did better than he thought. Suddenly, a door appears, and Yora tells them to proceed, but Rian tells him to give him a minute and takes out Sarah's information paper. Shinjin stops him from reading, but Rian says Shinjin promised her, and they are going to save her brother if they run into him. Shinjin says he is acting too righteous, and they might have to kill her brother in this game. But Rian also reads Jiren's information, which says he volunteered for this game. Rian gets shocked and wonders if the god game is known widely to the world outside. But Shinjin tells him to get going. Rian gets ready to leave, but Yora gives the Amamori before leaving, and Rian sees Shinjin seems to recognize it. But after seeing his chain, Rian teleports into a strange place. Rian sees a kid standing in front of him, and suddenly, he hears a girl coming there showing the cross of God her mother gave her to the kid, who is Rian's childhood self. Rian is shocked to see this scene, and his sister tells the kid Rian that God gave them a great harvest this year, but she says God also creates plagues and thunderstorms. Kid Rian starts crying and asks his sister if the missionary told her that, to which his sister replies he is the one who gave the cross to their mother, and then the mother gave it to her. Rian also wants the cross, but Ikika tells him to get his own and to come home with her as she is starving. While they are leaving, Rian stops them, but Ikika asks him who he is, and suddenly, that scene shatters like a glass, and Rian returns to the game. When Rian furiously asks Yoro what he did to them, he replies it's apparent that he gave them a gift, a reason for living. Rian didn't recognize that girl, yet he could feel she was all he had in this world. Ikika, his sister. Rian grabs Yora from his collar and asks if the memory is real, but Yora, with a tap of his finger, throws Rian away, and says only Rian can decide it and warns him from touching him again. Shinjin tells Rian to save his energy, and Yora says Rian is one step closer to the answer he seeks. Shinjin opens the door and pushes Rian through it as they are leaving, and after entering the door, they see a girl sitting on a chair there. The girl gets happy to see more visitors and asks if they like her collection of armors, which belonged to her favorite contenders of the previous god game. When Shinjin asks if they will waste time like this, she starts laughing and says they have a bunch of egoistical contestants this time. She says the ones who survive the longest are the foolish fools who would do anything to win, even picking fights with deities. Shinjin asks her name, and she replies that it's Inio, the goddess of war and destruction, but Shinjin replies he has never heard of her. 
Ri Yin tells Shinjin that they never thought of her because they don't have memories, and she will kill them at this rate. Inio is the judge of the third round, and they require three teammates. Suddenly, a door appears, and she tells them through this door, they'll be led to the Great Hall, and after that, they'll have a day to form a team of three to progress to the next round. Shinjin immediately enters the door, but Ri Yin asks Inio if she has seen Ikaka Asura. Inio yells that she is not a doorman and asks if he is really in a position to worry about someone else. Inio says perhaps he is worrying about himself, thinking that Ikaka holds the missing piece of his lost mind. Inio offers to make a deal with Ri Yin and tells him that if a god chooses a contestant as their champion, the champion will acquire a second divine power aligning with their identity. Rian knows a dual divine power will strengthen him, mainly because his eyes can't be used offensively. Inio says deceit and strength are two pillars that the game's winner will stand upon, and the one who wins the favor of the gods will have the most abilities in their arsenal. Inio tells him that someone who masters control over one power would surely overcome a foe who has two powers but only a basic grasp of fundamentals. Rian knows Shinjin can control flames, and Sarah uses her power to augment speed and strength but he doesn't know how his power works or how to activate it because it kicks in instinctively when he is in danger. According to Inio, a winner must do whatever it takes to win and ask if he has what it takes, to which he replies he has. Inio says if he reaches the fifth round and has three skills under his belt, she'll make him her champion and then increase the skills to five. Inio says that she can tell him about his sister because if he becomes her champion, she is betting on him winning the god game. Rian accepts her offer, so Inio says she'll be watching him and tells him to get out of her hall, so he passes through the door wondering if he can kill five people till the fifth round. This place is Inio's castle, where all the participants are eating and enjoying, but Rian knows they have only one day to find the third teammate, and prepare for the next round. Rian thinks Sinjin must be looking for a third teammate or a new team because that hall has stronger teammate options. Meanwhile, Yuron offers a girl to join his team, but she refuses to join a creepy guy's team and slams him on the table and tells him to screw off, or she'll rip his arm off and beat him to death with it and Rian wants her to be his third teammate. For some reason, Rian feels he shouldn't get too close, and something is holding him back. Suddenly, he sees her going somewhere, and he follows her, but she notices it and points a gun at him, asking why he is following her. Rian sees no one is around, and she is smart enough to confront him in a place like this. Rian told her he saw her take down and was impressed and wanted to ask her to team up with them for the next round. She hides her weapon and asks if he is a pervert like Yuron or if he is useful, to which Rian replies he thinks he is useful. She tells Rian to prove it and takes him to the combat hall, where she'll test him and show him the man who killed her partner. He tells Rian to beat him, and then she'll join their team. Rian feels that the man is huge, and he asks the girl how she and his enemy both survived the second round because he thought the loser was to be killed by God, to which she replies she won the game, but God spared that meathead. Rian asks her name and tells her his name, but she replies she'll let him know once he takes down that boulder to his knees. Ryan thinks it's a perfect time for him to test himself against a powerful enemy because he needs to become stronger to find the truth. Rian knows everyone there wants to analyze him, but he has nothing to hide, he has everything to gain from that guy and confronts him. Rian thinks everything in the god game is horrible, so he wonders why he feels bad for those who were killed. Suddenly, that guy Toros is going to punch him and tell him to wake up, so Rian immediately dodges his punch and moves back. Toros can feel Rian's tainted aura, so he asks who he is, to which Rian replies he is Rian Asura and didn't do anything. Toros responds that Rian hasn't done anything yet. Toros' teammate tells him not to be so aggressive, but suddenly, Rian asks him if he killed that girl's partner and why he is alive if she beat him. Toros asks if that girl sent Rian to ask him and starts laughing, but Rian asks him what is so funny, to which he replies he was thinking about this girl's friend's face when he popped her head like a grape. Toros says he should have been killed when the time ran out, but God let him live because he is too strong to die, and his teammate says God's game is entertainment for spectators, so to make future rounds more interesting, God kept Toros alive. Rian thinks Sarah is strong. But she doesn't catch God's eye, as God gives Toros another chance. Rian believes if he is more vital than Sarah and the girl he wants in his team beats Toros, then she is stronger than him. Rian thinks he shouldn't be afraid because he knows what he is fighting for and needs to surpass everyone. Rian kicks Toros between the legs, making him yell in pain, and is going to punch him. But Toros instantly grabs his fist with great force that Rian screams and slams him on the ground. Toros yells at him for picking a fight with people he doesn't know and tells Rian not to faint yet because he started it. 
Bet Girl sees other participants commenting that it's not a fun fight, and this ruins their mood. Suddenly, another girl watching this fight tells his teammate that he should help Rian. Yun asks his partner why he should help this boy because that boy asked for it. And that's how this game works. Idiots die off doing stupid things. Toros notices that Rian is still alive and says he is persistent, so he decides to end him and toss him in the air. But suddenly, a voice asks Rian why he is letting this weakling look down on them and tells him that he should show him his place. Suddenly, Rian's ability activates, and he sees the light, which leads him to the path to defeat Toros. Rian gets a hold of himself, hits Toros on his shoulder, and jumps down. The voice asks if Rian is going to stay afraid or have some fun. This switches a flip in Rian, which makes him forget his pain, and all he can feel is the hunger for victory, so he immediately runs towards Toros, dodges his punch and after kicking his feet he punches Toros down. Everyone is shocked, but Toros says he'll not let Rian walk after this, and he wakes up his divine power, which makes Rian nervous, and he again starts to feel pain in his body. With great anguish, Toros runs to attack Rian. But suddenly Yun stops them in between and says he feels like a teacher breaking up a fight, and that if they keep this up, he'll punish them. When Toros asks him who that guy is, Yun replies he is another player in the game, but Toros gets mad at him because he is in his way. Yun says they both landed some pretty nice hits on each other, but Toros won this bout, and he thinks Rian can't keep fighting, so he tells Toros to claim his victory and stop. Toros yells at Yun to step aside because he'll finish this fight by crushing Rian's head. But when Yun doesn't move, Toros says he'll slaughter them both and runs to beat them. Yun removes his glasses and asks Toros the color of his eyes while Rian can feel this guy is strong. And suddenly, Yun disappears for a moment to catch and wear his glasses. Meanwhile, Toros yells in pain while lying on the ground surrounded by Yun's energy, and Toros' teammates are shocked. Rian wonders if this guy can hurt someone by looking at them because he mentions his eyes and realizes more powerful monsters keep stepping in his path one by one. Rian worries about how he is supposed to become stronger than these guys, but Yun says Rian put on quite a show by challenging the biggest fish in the room. Rian remembers Yun from the waiting room, and Yun says Rian got pretty messed up, so he tells his teammate Kayla to give Rian a hand to the infirmary. But when Rian shockingly asks if there is an infirmary there, Yun tells him there is, and apparently they can heal any illness there even if a person is dead. Suddenly, Kayla heals his arm by locating his bones back to their position, and when she asks if it hurts, Rian replies it doesn't and thanks them. Rian feels strange to meet people who want to help him, and he wants to say something, but suddenly, he faints. Rian says he'll become the strongest and tells God that he'll be unable to stop him because even with all the deaths, he feels nothing but elation when he realizes he survived. Rian wonders who he was before this God game, and suddenly, when he opens his eyes, he wakes up in the infirmary. Meanwhile, the girl he offered to join his team is also present there, and she says Rian is something, not strong, but he has something that a lot of the other guys are missing. Simultaneously, Kayla arrives, and after seeing him healed, she says technology there is something else and says his gusty behavior will get him killed if he keeps it up, and he can't always depend on God to heal him. Rian thinks Kayla is right and he is always making these bold decisions without thinking of the consequences. And if he keeps acting like this, his luck has to run out. Suddenly, the girl agrees to join his team because he knocked Toros down and asks if he has another teammate, to which Rian replies he is not sure. The girl says if he has someone in mind, they can find and lock them in, and she wants to see how strong they are for herself. Rian asks her name as she promised to tell him, and she tells him it's Era Park. She tells Rian to trust her because he'll not regret having her on his team. As Rian looked into Era's eyes, he saw her bubbly personality vanish. Instead, her gaze was filled with hard confidence, and it was the look of someone who knew they were strong. Rian believed in Aria from the moment he saw her in the feasting hall, and she was worth far more than the pain he had experienced in his bout with Tauros. Rian thinks he can trust her in this horrific game, so they shake hands, and Rian thanks Kayla for helping him. Rian asks if Yun is around because he wants to thank him personally, to which Kayla replies he is outside and tells them to follow her. While going out, Rian sees the minions working in the infirmary, and Kayla says they beat the hell out of a person if someone tries to steal something from the infirmary, and tells them that the thing in the vials there can heal any wound, illness, and death. Suddenly, Rian sees Yun standing outside, and Yun throws a coin towards Rian, which he immediately catches. Kayla tells Yun to stop playing around. But Yun replies he wants to see something for himself and says Rian has some unique eyes, which is his divine power. Rian calls him observant and says he came to thank Yun for saving him. 
but Yun tells him not to mention it because he didn't want to watch the big man bust a hole through him. Yun says he admires that ri Yin took a stand for his friend, to which ri Yin replies he wants her to join his team. But suddenly Yun offers him to abandon his friend and come with him and Kayla for the third round. ri Yin is shocked, but he knows after seeing what Yun can do, anyone would take this offer. ri Yin has doubts that Yun will go far in the god game. ri Yin knows Yun uses his divine power without anyone understanding its secret, and even with his eyes, ri Yin can't unravel the mystery of Yun's strength. Also, ri Yin knows if Kayla has made it this far, she must be able to hold on to her own in a fight, and he thinks her healing power would be helpful in a round with teammates. ri Yin wonders if Yun and Kayla truly helped him out of the goodness of their heart but is sure they want something in return. ri Yin remembers Shinjin told him his eyes are like gods, and just like Shinjin, Yun is also interested in the secret of his divine power, so he apologizes to Yun that he has already promised to another team. Yun is shocked, but when he asks where is the third member of their team, Shinjin suddenly arrives and tells Yun it's him. Yun remembers Shinjin as the bold idiot who summoned his sword in the waiting room, so while removing his glasses, he asks Shinjin what color his eyes are, but Shinjin replies who cares when he'll gauge them out. Yun says he'll care, but suddenly, Kayla stops him from removing his glasses and tells him to be nice. Yun says he is joking and that they'll have to find someone else to be their third member and says he is sure he'll see Ri Yin around. While leaving, he tells ri Yin not to get himself killed and wants to talk more to him someday. Shinjin tells ri Yin that Yun is the second strongest he has seen at the castle, and when ri Yin asks if Shinjin is the strongest, Shinjin replies he is not because Yun is stronger than him. ri Yin wishes not to face Yun and Kayla anytime soon in this game, and when he asks who is the strongest, Shinjin replies if they run into that guy, he'll tell him. Shinjin asks Era who she is, and Era introduces herself and says Shinjin must be ri Yin's other partner. But Shinjin is furious that ri Yin chose without consulting him. ri Yin says he didn't know if Shinjin was going to partner with him for the third round. But Shinjin furiously asks what he means because he says he is not going to show his abilities to new partners every round. Suddenly, Era says it seems like they get along and tells Shinjin that he'll not regret having her on his team, so he gets okay with it and tells them to follow him. When she asks Shinjin where they are going, he replies that ri Yin never learned to summon his weapon, and he doesn't want any dead weight on his team, so they need to teach him. ri Yin is shocked that he will learn how to summon his weapon and remembers the glaive he used in the first round and how smooth it felt in his hands as if he had held it all his life. ri Yin notices, even now, as his hands quiver before him, he cannot imagine all the ways he could use that weapon. ri Yin feels his mind holds years of knowledge with this blade, yet he remembers none of the training and wonders what the glaive means. Shinjin tells ri Yin that a weapon is an extension of a person and asks if ri Yin summoned it in the first round, then he should think about that sensation. ri Yin remembers energy came from the center of his suit and surged into his hands, but he doesn't know what started that torrent of energy. Shinjin says there is a defining feeling that each person has, forcibly conjuring that emotion and calling upon his weapon will summon it. ri Yin wonders what that means, and Era asks if God seriously does not tell him anything. Era suddenly summons her gun and says after the first round, God told her a feeling from her past that lets her summon this gun. When ri Yin asks what the feeling is, she says it's longing and says after he summons the weapon for the first time on his own, it becomes as natural as walking, but he needs to get over that hump of summoning it first. Era says the first round of summoning shouldn't count because she thinks God initiated it, and asks if God didn't give ri Yin any hint about what his feeling is. When ri Yin says they didn't speak about his weapon and in the first round he started as handcuffed too, Shinjin and Era get shocked that he still survived. Shinjin has not heard of anyone who started the god game with such a disadvantage before, and when Era asks what he is thinking, Shinjin says he doesn't know. Something is off about ri Yin's situation, and it's either God wants him to die, or ri Yin is too strong thus he needs to be suppressed in some way. ri Yin says why God hates him should not be their priority, and for whatever reason God puts him at a disadvantage, he still needs to bridge that gap on his own. ri Yin asks Shinjin what his feeling is, to which Shinjin replies it's rage, and they require a feeling that represents their identity. Shinjin asks if ri Yin can find anything from the glimpse of the memories he had after the second round. Shinjin says if ri Yin can't find a way, he'll not be teaming up with him for the third round because the weight of his weakness will permeate to the rest of the team. When Era asks Shinjin if that is a little harsh, Shinjin says harsh is making two million souls fight each other in a death game for entertainment, and if ri Yin can't summon his weapon in the coming round, he is destined to die. Era tells ri Yin he can do this because he has already surprised her once and tells him to find the feeling that defines him. 
Rian remembers when he touched the metal of the cross, the image of his memory erected around him like a simulation. He smelled the fresh air and felt the breeze of an unknown land caressing him. Rian remembers he saw his sister Ikika, but he can't find the right emotion and wonders if he is searching for a specific kind of rage or a particular aspect of love. Rian sees himself crying and remembers Yora gave him a gift and a reason for living. Rian thinks if God had never chosen him to enter this game, he would not have to worry if he'd live or die each day. Rian believes that the monster god took away his life and everything, and because of him, he didn't even recognize his sister or self in this memory. Rian thinks because of God, he'll die in this game and says he'll kill him, so he decides to forget about gaining the power to survive and says he'll use it to butcher God himself. Rian decides to destroy all the deities that sit by and watch this sick game and thinks he needs more names than Tenjin, Sarah, and Jurin to kill God. Rian believes one day he'll find the slip of paper with God's name, and then he'll laugh. Suddenly, his weapon appears in his hands, and Era gets happy he did it, but she says he blacked out and started laughing. Era says he didn't respond to them, and they started to get worried. But when Rian asked how long he was unresponsive, Shinjin replied for three hours. Rian knows when he comes to consciousness, the first thing he remembers is smiling, and it was the same smile he wore when Sarah and Tenjin died, and he wonders what the hell is wrong with him. When Shinjin asks Rian about his defining feeling, Rian says he doesn't know why, but every step further into God's game is supposed to bring him closer to the truth that he wants to kill but he feels like he is losing himself. When Rian, while crying, replies it's bloodlust, Shinjin and Era get shocked, but Rian replies it's not him. Era says he doesn't know himself, and none of them knows, but Rian wonders if this is who he is. In the memory, he seemed innocent, and he wondered when he strayed from that path to where bloodlust became his defining feeling. Rian says it doesn't matter, and if that was him in the past life or whatever memories he is seeing, then that's not him now, and however he acts in the future will be because he has changed. Shinjin says whoever Rian was in the past, Rian can't ignore that because that is not how this game works, but if he believes he can fight against whoever he truly is, then he can be Shinjin's guest. Shinjin says as long as Rian has the power to slay the enemies in their path, he doesn't care, but tells Rian to try not to lose himself. Suddenly, Shinjin summons his weapon to make sure Rian is ready for the next round, and Rian replies he is ready. When Shinjin asks Era if she is ready, she replies she is ready, and then Shinjin starts training with them. They sparred, hammering their moves and skills into each other to improve their synergy, and Shinjin seemed a little less hesitant in showing his powers while Era was open about her abilities and weapon. The transparency was refreshing for Rian. He felt a little less alone in that game with Era. One hour before the third round, they were called to the feasting hall, and after seeing everyone, Rian doubts it's all the people in the game because it's difficult to fit them all in that hall and thinks there are probably multiple castles. Suddenly, Shinjin shows Rian the strongest person in that hall, and Rian feels no one has frightened him this much, quite like this guy. When Rian asks who that guy is, Shinjin says he doesn't know because that guy hasn't spoken to anyone in the castle and doesn't have any partners. Era is shocked and thinks that the guy is crazy, but Shinjin tells her that the guy is confident enough to kill everyone in the hall. Suddenly, Enio enters the hall and hopes the participants are ready to give their lives, so she says they'll begin the next round. Yora explains for round three of the god game, they asked them to form groups of three, and those who are ready to proceed to the third round may do so. Yora says they have three hours to enter the gateway before this castle self-destructs, and when Ineo asks the strongest guy if he is enjoying the game, that guy replies she is annoying as always, and they can't wait to sew her mouth shut when this is over. Yora asks if he will be with a team, but that guy alone enters the door, so Ineo gets furious and says she'll kill him. Era says it seems the goddess and that guy know each other, and Shinjin agrees, but Rian says they all met Ineo before coming there. They decide to get going, and Yora asks if they'll be a team for round 3, to which Shinjin replies they are, and Yora tells them to step through. Rian notices Era radiates the same confidence as when he first saw her, and she is not scared of the path ahead. In the first two rounds, Rian barely survives, so he cannot rely on others to always be there to save him and decides this time. With his eyes and weapon, he'll win with his strength. After entering the door, Rian asks if she is nervous, to which she replies she is not because they are strong and their wounds will heal if they get hurt. Before entering the door of round 3, Shinjin tells Rian that managing his nerves is how he'll survive the next round, and as he opens the door, they cannot see anything. Rian asks Shinjin to give them a light, 
and Shinjin tells him to wait a moment because he thinks they are in a cave. Suddenly, the fire lights up in the cave automatically, and they see a monkey-like human. Shinjin gets nervous to see it. But when Era asks if he knows him, Shinjin replies he knows, and they are in trouble. Shinjin tells them this monkey is Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, and Wukong replies he is glad they know him and says he'll be their facilitator for the game. Wukong says the game they'll be playing is to capture the flag, and Inio got in trouble, so they had to bring Wukong in for the third round. Wukong wants to see if they can impress him and asks if they like games, to which Era replies she does, but Shinjin tells him to get on with the explanation. Wukong says somewhere in the cave is another team, and both teams are given a flag, so to win, their team must steal the enemy's flag and return it to theirs in their home base. Shinjin understands they need to have both flags to win, and Wukong says they'll have three hours for this round, and as usual, murder is allowed. Era asks Wukong what will happen if they lose, to which Wukong replies he'll get to pick one person from the team to survive, and the other two will be eliminated. They get shocked, and Wukong tells them not to worry because if they lose, they still have a chance that they can live to see the fourth round. Wukong says it's time for him to explain the rules to the other team and says when the timer starts, they can start the round, and after saying he'll kill them if they cheat, Wukong disappears. Riyan asks about the strategy, but Shinjin says they don't know who the enemy is, and he is strongest among them, so he'll stay back and guard the flag while the other two should take the offensive. Era asks if he thinks he is worth both Riyan and her, but when Shinjin tries to explain, she says it's fine as the game is starting and says Riyan and she'll bring back the flag, so Shinjin should make sure not to lose theirs. They go on to bring the flag, round 3 begins, and Era tells Riyan he seems calm, but he feels numb. Riyan thinks it's weird that once he starts fighting, there is a switch that flips inside him, and in moments when one would expect to be afraid, he feels nothing while he is killing, and it all feels natural. Riyan wants to know why he can switch off his emotions so easily, why he is not afraid, and why bloodlust is his defining power. It's the third round, and he hardly knows anything about himself and the sister he is looking for. Era asks if they returned him the memory about his sister, to which he replies he saw her but is unsure if he'll recognize her and that she could have been in Inio's castle, and he wouldn't have known. When Riyan asks if Era is looking for someone, she replies she is not because her slip of paper just said her name and age. And it's a bit jarring because everyone has their reasons for wanting to continue living, but she doesn't have any. Era says even the memory they gave her is useless, and Riyan says she doesn't have to tell if she doesn't want to. But Era says it's fine. Aria says it was her on the floor as a kid, bleeding with a big gash on her forehead, and someone stood over her, a shadow, but she couldn't tell who it was. Riyan asks if her reason to survive should be to know who that was and beat the hell out of them, but she says it sounds like a revenge story someone like Shinjin would enjoy. Riyan says Shinjin is a bit angsty, but Sarah says he is the worst and tells Riyan that she is glad he stalked her in that hallway because if he didn't, she would not have met a gusty idiot who could make her smile even in this hellish game. Era thanks him, but Riyan thinks no one in this game genuinely tried to befriend him, and even Shinjin sought him solely for the mystery of his divine power, but he dared to call Era his first friend in this game. Meanwhile, Shinjin thinks he underestimated his opponents in this game, but that's not happening again, and suddenly, he notices someone is going to attack him from above, so he stops that person with his sword but sees it's Wukong. Wukong asks him how he is, and he does not think they will cross paths so soon. Wukong says Shinjin looks progressive with partners, but Shinjin tells him to shut up, says interrupting the game is against the rules, and warns God will have Wukong's head. Wukong says Shinjin has always been so stiff and tells him not to worry because no one will be there for a while because it's a big cave. Wukong asks why Shinjin thinks he gave them so much time for this round and says he wants to make a deal because he wants to become Shinjin's sponsor and make him his champion if he does something for him. When Shinjin asks what's the catch, Wukong says he knows what Shinjin wants, and it's not impossible, but to make it happen, Shinjin needs to become the strongest. Wukong says Shinjin needs as many divine sponsors as he can get, and he wants Shinjin to succeed because it would be chaotic, but he also wants Shinjin to kill his new friend, Era Park. Wukong says if Shinjin kills her, he'll become his sponsor, and it doesn't have to be in this round because he'll give him three rounds, including this one, to eradicate her from the god game. But if she dies on her own, the deal is off. When Shinjin asks what she did to Wukong, he replies she did nothing. But he doesn't like her current sponsor, so he wants that sponsor to suffer from something he did a few centuries ago. Shinjin gets furious that Wukong is bringing his politics to the god game 
But Wukong says Shinjin knows that the god game is much more than just entertainment. Wukong thinks it would be easy for Shinjin to kill a girl he just met. But Shinjin says maybe when the game is over, he'll kill Wukong, too. Wukong says he likes his attitude and has faith in him because only the ones with the strongest will are going to survive. Shinjin wonders what Riyan would think if he did that. But he thinks he shouldn't care because Riyan is another stepping stone to his goals. On the other hand, Riyan and Era have been walking for an hour and suddenly they see the enemy's flag but they haven't seen any of them yet. Suddenly, someone from behind tries to attack Riyan, but he timely dodges it, and Era asks them to come out. Suddenly, they see Tauros and his teammates there, and Callista says Tauros was right that the other team would split up. Tauros says he has unfinished business with Riyan and Era. Era thinks Shinjin's plan is a failure because Tauros predicted their opponents would split up, so they stack their defense to overwhelm them. And Riyan believes that with three hours on the clock, that's plenty of time to quash attackers and flip to the offensive. Tauros thinks God must be listening because they delivered his prey right at his feet, and tells his teammate Callista that Riyan is his prey. Callista tells him to do what he wants and tells Era that Tauros told her plenty about her and her guardian, Zeus, but Era replies it's Zephyr. When Callista says it's the weaker god, Era gets furious and attacks with her gun, but Callista blocks her attack with an ice wall. Era says it's troublesome and aims at the wall, but Callista realizes Era is using her divine power to attack the wall, so she immediately stops it and says Tauros told her about Era's tricks. Callista asks Era if anything is up her sleeves other than curving bullets, and Riyan thinks it's unlucky their opponents know about Era's abilities. Suddenly, Era shoots at the roof, controls the rocks with her power, and attacks her opponents, saying it's hysterical if they think she can only curve bullets. Tauros immediately destroys those rocks before they hit them and tells Callista not to let her guard down. Riyan understands Era's ability allows her to move objects in the direction she wants, but the larger the thing, the harder it is to move, and Era has perfect control over it. Riyan knows Callista's ice barriers provide the perfect defense, and meanwhile, Tauros's raw strength gives them a frightening offense. Riyan wonders why their third teammate is just standing there, and when he asks Era about Tauros, she says if Tauros wants, he can capture the force of his motion and eject it in a concentrated attack almost like a blast, but there is something else from the second round which she doesn't understand. Riyan says it's good enough because, with his eyes, he'll uncover the rest, summon his glaive, and charge to attack Tauros. Tauros tells Callista to get ready to kill the opponents, and she immediately forms ice spikes to hit Riyan, but he dodges them, and Era breaks them with her power. Riyan tries to punch Tauros, but Tauros blows a strong punch, which Riyan dodges, so it hits the cave wall and cracks it. Riyan gets worried to see Tauros is so strong and tries to stab him, but Tauros blocks the attack with his gloves. Riyan continues with his attacks, but he can't see an opening, and when he tries to hit his legs, Tauros jumps up and prepares for a counterattack. Riyan immediately moves behind Tauros, dodging his punch, but Riyan still doesn't see the path of the killing opportunity and wonders why it's not working. Suddenly, Callista freezes Riyan's legs, and he understands that Callista has been covering Tauros's weak points. Previously, Riyan's fights have all been him fighting one opponent at a time, and he hadn't considered the potential that a teammate could negate any opportune moments. Tauros punches Riyan into the wall, and tells his teammate Hyten not to touch Riyan because he'll finish him. Tauros picks up Riyan from his head and asks why Riyan and God have the same eyes and what his relationship is with God. Callista tells Tauros to stop interrogating and finish Riyan, but suddenly, Era shoots Callista and furiously tells Tauros to let Riyan go. Era feels the further she progresses through the god game, the harder it is to convince herself to continue. Era thinks everyone has a reason to fight, but she doesn't feel the same way and wonders what's the point of living in a cruel world like this where everyone is against each other, and there is only one winner in god's game. Era doesn't care much about herself and thinks why she is still fighting. But meanwhile, Tauros is shocked to see Era's second gun and asks where she got something like that because she never used it in the second round. Era replies she doesn't need it, and Tauros calls her selfish for not helping her partner in the second round because she decided to hide her strength. When Tauros asks why she is showing her cards now to save Riyan, Era remembers the time her last teammate told her they would make it to the next round and they will find a reason for Era to keep living. Era remembers Lily asked for her help when Tauros killed her, but she was unable to do anything, and she knows Lily was pure and optimistic in this hell, and if someone deserved to survive, it was her. Era remembers no material how many times she shot Tauros, he refused to fall. 
Maybe if she had used her second gun, she could have killed him faster and saved Lily. In the end, Era thought everyone in the god game was supposed to be her enemy, but now she thinks holding back was a mistake and should not have let Lily die like that. The regret haunted her every moment since the second round, and she was naive, thinking she would be fighting through this game alone, so she decided not to let Tauros hurt any more of her teammates. Callista says she is going to kill her, but Era replies she is already dead and starts shooting Callista. Callista tries to block her attacks, but she cannot move because of the ice walls around her, so she has to block from the front. Suddenly, Era's attack breaks through the wall and hits Callista in the stomach. When Callista asks how she did that, Era replies Zephyr's divine power works differently with each gun. Era's first gun, Flicker, allows her to curve small objects and control their trajectory with her gaze, while the second gun, Scintillate, lets her control the acceleration of objects she can see. Era says she made a mistake last time, but now she'll not hold back. Callista says it's complicated that Era has two powers, but still, it doesn't matter, and after apologizing to Tauros because Era is now her prey, Callista decides to go all out with her power. Tauros tells Callista to butcher Era, and she uses all her divine power to create an army of ice soldiers and orders them to kill Era. Suddenly, Era starts shooting with both her guns and uses scintillate power to move the bullets in slow motion and create a barrier of bullets in front of her. Era immediately uses Flicker to move the bullets at high speed, and they start hitting the ice soldiers. Era kept firing the bullets and filling the air with them, creating a web of red and blue lights. Callista tries to protect herself with an ice shield, but her ice soldiers are falling against the bullet storm, and her barrier starts to break. The bullets severely wound Callista, and Era thinks she doesn't fight for herself, so she'll fight for her friends. Toros is shocked to see her power, but Regan is happy because he didn't know Era had such power. Callista says it's up to Toros now, and suddenly, Era shoots her down, shocks everyone, and tells Toros it's his turn. Regan knew Era was strong, but this was far beyond his expectations, and Toros furiously asked Hyten if he was not going to do something and if he had a contract. Hyten replies if he had told Toros, he wouldn't have partnered with him, and Rian is shocked that Hyten made a deal with God. Rian remembers Ineo made a deal with him and thinks like this. Hyten also had a deal with a deity, so he is not fighting. Toros gets furious and says after butchering Era and Rian, he'll butcher Hyten and attack Rian, but he dodges it. Suddenly, Rian feels Toros is getting stronger, and when Era asks how he can tell, Rian replies he can see his divine power makes him stronger the longer the fight goes on and Era also noticed it in the second round. Toros tells them his guardian is the Minotaur, and the more divine power used around him, the stronger he becomes, and unfortunately for them, they figured it too late. Toros punches Era, but she dodges, and the attack hits the roof, making her think she is dead if she gets hit by his gauntlet's air cannon. Suddenly, the rocks from the roof fall, but Rian escapes them and wonders if Era made it too. Toros starts attacking Rian and hits his head down, Unexpectedly, Era shoots Toros' shoulder, but he gets furious and counterattacks, so her gun falls from her hand. Meanwhile, Rian can see the path to kill Toros, but he can't reach it in time, and Toros attacks the ground, which pushes Rian away. Era says they need to kill Toros now while his partner is not fighting and covers for Rian. But Rian thinks he cannot rely on others always to be there to save him. Rian knows Era took down Callista on her own, and it's time for him to do his part now. Toros says Callista was the second person who spoke to him without fear in this horrific game, and the first was a boy whose name he never learned. That kid couldn't have been older than 16 and looked at Toros with determined eyes and offered to team up with him. Toros didn't care if that kid was the strongest because he was someone who didn't quiver in front of him, so he partnered with him. Toros wanted to bring him to salvation, but the second round didn't go according to the plan, and he died. Toros regrets he failed to protect him and never learned his name, so God asked Toros if he wanted a second chance to avenge his partner. Toros could not rest easy knowing the boy's murderer was out there, so when he woke up, he was alive, screaming on the floor of Ineo's castle. At that time, Callista approached Toros and told him to stop crying because people would think he was weak and ask him what was wrong. Callista listened to him instead of training and meeting other partners and told him revenge wouldn't make him feel better. Callista asks if he wants revenge for someone he doesn't know because the killer also has no choice, and it is a part of the game. Callista offered Toros to team up with her for the third round so they could find the killer together, and Toros accepted her offer. That was the first time Toros laughed since arriving at that horrible place, and in his memory, Yura showed him he was a builder, so a life like killing and watching others die was never for him. 
In the God game, he needs to be imposing to intimidate others, but he wonders what his life was like before and if he had people he cared about. Rian tries to stab Toros, but he grabs his blade and tries to punch, but Era shoots his hand. Toros gets mad at her, so he leaves Rian's blade and furiously attacks Era, but suddenly Rian stabs his legs, which makes Toros fall. Rian is about to kill Toros, but Toros holds his blade while Era keeps shooting Toros. Toros says Era killed his two friends, and Rian replies he understands, but he stabs Toros in his chest. Toros grabs Rian's head and says he can't take revenge but can take Era's partner down with him. Rian yells in pain, but when Era shoots Toros, he leaves Rian and falls, saying he is done with this game and dies. When Rian sees Toros' information paper, it is written that he searches for those he can trust, and after reading this, Rian is sorry because he took that from Toros. Rian assumes Hyten will not let them take the flag, but Hyten replies it's not like that because he has a contract with God. When Rian asks what it is, Hyten replies it's killing an entire team on his own, and suddenly, he summons a weird octopus-like puppet. Hyten asks CH Tullhu what he thinks of Rian and Era, to which the puppet replies they are weak, but they get shocked that the puppet is talking. Hyten says he also thinks they are weak because one is barely conscious and the other is barely standing. Hyten asks the puppet which one it thinks has the stronger mind, and the puppet replies it's the boy. Hyten thinks this boy is bizarre, but it doesn't matter because he decides to take him down. So when Rian runs to attack him, Hyten uses his divine power, Mad Dreamer. Rian thinks it's an illusion and drops his glaive, thinking that there must be a floor. But when it doesn't touch the ground, he thinks Hyten teleported him somewhere else. Suddenly, his inner voice tells him to keep calm because he knows what it is, and the puppet asks if he fears death or God more. The puppet unexpectedly turns into a giant octopus and asks if Rian fears him or if he fears losing his friends while showing Rian an illusion that the octopus is crushing Era and Shinjin. Rian's inner voice stops him from moving, and when the octopus sees it's not working, he uses Rian's sister to ask if he fears he'll never find her and never know the truth about her and himself. Rian understands CH Tolhu is a god, as when he asks what a god is doing in the game, CH Tolhu asks who said that god can't play the game. The octopus says Rian still has to understand why this game exists, and tells Rian that it is a mere part of Hyten's divine power and weapon. Rian understands that Hyten's divine power and weapon are related, just like Era's flicker and scintillate synergize with her pistols. Rian knows Era's weapons can kill, but he still doesn't understand Hyten's power, so his inner voice tells him to butcher the octopus, and suddenly Rian sees the path of opportunity to kill, which he thinks must be leading to Hyten and this octopus is an illusion. Suddenly, a bullet from Era's gun hits Rian's shoulder, and he escapes the mad dreamer. Hyten is shocked because no one has ever done that before. The puppet tells Hyten that Rian's eyes allow him to see through their mirage, so Hyten says he should take them out. Suddenly, Rian sees Era is stuck in the mirage and is shooting in the air, so he runs to save her. But Era says she can't do this anymore and points the gun on her head to commit suicide. Rian immediately saves her from shooting and punches her to faint her and feels bad for her, but Rian says it's Hyten's fault. Hyten says after watching their fight with Toros and Callista, he used to find Era more interesting, but there is something about Rian, and he is a bit mad. When Rian asks what he means, Hyten says he knows Rian can hear that bloodthirsty voice because CH Tolhu told him a bit about Rian. Rian feels Hyten was calm before summoning CH Tolhu, but after he summoned it, he has been slipping further and further from normalcy. When Rian asks what he knows about him, Hyten tells him to taste it, and Rian falls into his memories, where he sees his parents dead, lying on the floor. Rian starts crying. He doesn't know who those people are, but Hyten tells him that he knows them and he just doesn't remember them. Rian gets mad at Hyten because he doesn't know if it's a real memory, to which Hyten replies that Rian doesn't remember, but his body remembers it. Rian notices his hands are trembling, and he feels a rage that's not his. Hyten says he wants to see the mad part of Rian that he is hiding because CH Tolhu told him that Rian is one of the craziest in the game. When Rian says he doesn't know, CH Tolhu tells him to stop acting like a fool, and Rian knows the foreign voice that calls him from the back of his mind, the part of him that felt relieved when Tenjin and Sarah died. Rian remembers the first time he saw a corpse in the game, a switch flipped in him. Suddenly, when it flips again, Rian says they finally managed to drag his dark side out. Hyten and CH Tolhu get shocked, and Rian furiously asks them what they want from him. Hyten replies that they wanted the real Rian and tells CH Tolhu that they did it and now can prove themselves and kill. CH Tolhu says he seeks to make Rian his champion, 
but Hyten gets shocked because it was not the plan. However, Rian refuses and asks if C.H. Tolhu thinks Rian forgot about what he showed him and says it was a sensitive topic. C.H. Tolhu says as he thinks, Rian remembers everything, and Hyten is shocked that Rian remembers the past without God awakening his memories and asks what this means. Rian replies that God cannot surpass the real him and asks why Hyten thinks God gave Rian these eyes. Rian says God bet on him to win the game, but Hyten gets shocked and asks why C.H. Tolhu didn't tell him that Rian is God's champion. C.H. Tolhu asks Rian if he won't accept the offer and says with another divine power in his arsenal, he can rise to the top of the game and tell him not to be a fool. Rian says foolishness was summoning him by making him furious and he asks if C.H. Tolhu really thought Rian forgot about what happened to his family. Rian tells C.H. Tolhu to stay out of his matters, and suddenly, Hyten gets worried to see their mirage crumbling because God's eyes negate illusion. C.H. Tolhu says Rian won't be able to eradicate all of their illusions fast enough, and tells Hyten to kill him because he is a wasted talent. Rian asks if C.H. Tolhu can back up such big words and rushes to attack Hyten, but Hyten immediately creates another illusion. Rian breaks through it, shocking Hyten. But Hyten immediately creates another illusion. Rian says none of this will faze him. Rian manages to pick up his glaive and is about to kill Hyten. But he creates an illusion of Rian's mother in front of them to stop him. Without even hesitating, Rian cuts off the illusion head. So Hyten immediately creates his clones and surrounds Rian, saying he is crazy to cut off his mother. Rian replies she is already dead and starts stabbing the illusions. Suddenly, he uses his eyes to identify the path of opportunity, and when Hyten tries to attack him, Rian cuts off his arm. But still, it was an illusion, and for some reason, he can't disperse those illusions like the others and says it's interesting that Hyten is full of surprises. Rian thinks Hyten's divine power seems to have multiple layers because by making eye contact, he can cast his enemies into an illusion of his creation, and that way, he can easily execute those with weaker minds. Then, there is Hyten's illusion of the physical world in which Rian sees the path of opportunity, but it disappears when he strikes, which means Hyten can switch places with his illusion. Rian thinks Hyten knows Rian will ignore any illusion that's out of the ordinary, but by creating clones, he can hide himself and switch amongst them. Rian thinks it's fun, and as he tries to stab a clone, he understands Hyten switched, so he tries to stab the one behind him, but Hyten again switches. As Rian knows, Hyten is looking for an opening, so he immediately identifies him and grabs his head. Rian slams Hyten's head on the floor and stabs him, but Hyten disappears in the air and after reappearing, he puts a gun on Era's head. Rian asks if Hyten thinks taking a stranger hostage is going to save him, and C.H. Tolhu says it's true because Rian just cut through an illusion of his mother. Rian says the octopus is right that nothing will stop him from eviscerating Hyten, and he'll start by chopping off the puppet's head. Hyten says if Rian stabs him, he'll switch, and it can kill his partner, but Rian says he doesn't care if his partner dies because this game has only one survivor anyway. Rian is going to stab, but suddenly, his inner voice tells him to stop because it won't let him kill Era, and he grabs his neck. The crazy Rian says he is doing this for Rian to win this round and says he is the real Rian, and not let the innocent Rian, who knows nothing, take over. The innocent Rian says he'll discover the truth on his own, and he'll not end up like the crazy Rian. But his crazy side says he doesn't have a choice, the deeper he gets into this game, the crazier he'll become, and he can't escape who he is. Suddenly, Rian switches to his normal self and says he can escape his crazy self. Hyten thinks Rian threw away his only chance of beating him, and while saying he does not need the hostage, he is about to shoot Era, but suddenly Shinjin arrives there and pushes Hyten away. Shinjin saves Era, but Rian is shocked to see him and Shinjin after seeing the corpses of Toros, and Callista says it seems like Rian and Era have been busy. Shinjin tells Rian to take Era and get the flag because there is not much time left. But Rian tells Shinjin to take Era and score while he faces Hyten, and ensures they get through. Shinjin says Rian is wounded, but Rian replies his divine power is the perfect match for Hyten, so Shinjin should let him defeat Hyten. Shinjin can't believe in just one round, Rian's aura feels completely changed, so he picks up Era and tells Rian not to die before the next round. Rian warns Shinjin not to look into Hyten's eyes unless he wants to get caught in an illusion, and when they run to attack Hyten, Hyten starts shooting at them with Era's gun. After seeing Hyten's clones, Shinjin understands that Rian's eyes make him better suited for an opponent like this, so he decides to take the flag and run away, but Hyten aims to shoot at him. 
Regan immediately cuts the bullet with his glaive, which shocks Heighten and Regan because shots can come from anywhere, but Regan is fast enough to detect them. Regan covers for Shinjin while he gets away, and Heighten gets furious because the masked guy got away, but he feels something is different about Regan. CH Tell who also notices that Regan's reactions and movements are much faster than before and seem closer to his true self. Heighten says to see the trajectory of a bullet is one thing, but to have the speed to react and split them is another. Meanwhile, Shinjin takes the opponent's flag, and CH Tolhu tells Heighten that Rian knows the bullet's trajectory before he moves, which means he can see the future, and Heighten is shocked to hear this. Rian says they are right that his divine power is omniscience. On the contrary, Rian's crazy self is furious that innocent Rian took over because he didn't think the innocent Rian could overtake him. The crazy Rian thinks his innocent side will get him killed, but the normal Rian says he can take care of Heighten on his own. His crazy side doesn't trust him because he needs to survive, so he decides to give his innocent side a hint on how to win the round. The crazy side says it's a secret god hid from Rian, his true divine power omniscience. Meanwhile, CH Tolhu realizes there is another layer to Rian's divine power that they didn't anticipate. But Heighten says, as Rian didn't use it before, why did he suddenly start now? CH Tolhu thinks perhaps Rian didn't know how to use it before, or maybe something has changed. And with this power, he has become a completely different opponent. Heighten thinks it doesn't matter if Rian can see the future because he is injured, so he decides to attack until something breaks through. Heighten and his clones start shooting Rian from all directions, thinking most of the bullets are illusions and if he keeps changing positions and attacking from all directions. There is so much that Rian's eyes can take in, and if he overwhelms Rian, he can win. Rian starts dodging the bullets, and CH Tolhu says no human can process this magnitude of illusion and attacks even with omniscient eyes. However, Rian avoids the shots, and Heighten can see Rian is going to throw his glaive at him, so he switches immediately. CH Tolhu tries to stop Heighten because it's a fake attack, but he already switches, and when Rian throws his glaive after identifying the real Heighten, Heighten again manages to switch on time. Unexpectedly, he gets a punch from Rian, and he falls, but CH Tolhu tries to wake him up because he needs to switch. Heighten knew Rian saw it all, and he knew Heighten would switch again and when he threw away his weapon. He forced Heighten to switch so that Heighten lowered his guard for a second and Heighten played right into his hands. Heighten tells Rian he is a worthy opponent and hopes they can face each other again someday, but Rian stabs him with his glaive. After killing Heighten, Rian notices his information paper on the ground, but he doesn't take Heighten's paper and leaves from there. Meanwhile, Shinjin reaches the winning spot while hoping Rian is still alive, but suddenly, he remembers Wukong told him that he wants him to kill Era, so he gets angry. Suddenly, there is an announcement that round 3 is complete, and Wukong appears where Rian is and says it was an entertaining fight. Wukong says Rian's divine power is intriguing because God has never given his eyes to a participant before and asks how much his eyes can see. Wukong tells Rian not to tell him the secret because he will discover it on his own, and as the door for the next round appears, Wukong tells Rian to proceed. When Rian asks about Shinjin and Era, Wukong tells him to find them himself, so Rian opens the door, and suddenly Wukong pushes him inside. Rian was shocked to see Yun there, but Yun said it was nice to see a familiar face, and he knew Rian would make it to the next round. Rian is also glad that Yun made it and asks about Kayla, to which Yun replies she is fine. Suddenly, they see the strongest guy get in, telling them to stop all of this because companionship has no place in God's game. Rian gets nervous to see this guy and wonders if he survived the third round alone. Meanwhile, a female participant enters and asks if they are already in the next round, to which Rian replies he is not sure. Rian asks others if they know why Wukong separates them from their teammates, but Yun replies he doesn't know, and the girl says maybe it's another waiting room. Suddenly, Wukong enters the room from a hole in the roof, saying he wants to play a bonus game with them, and the winner will become his champion. Wukong says skill and talent are major factors in God's game, but he thinks some games are missing something like luck, and today, he'll test theirs. On the other hand, Enio is present in front of God, and he says he gave everyone one rule, but she neglected it. God says he told them not to choose the same champion as him and to offer his winner more power to tip the game's balance. God especially talks about Rii and Asura, but Enio asks what's so special about Rii, and she says God speaks of balance, 
but he handicaps Regan at the beginning of the game compared to the other contestants. Inio says God hid Regan's weapon and divine power from him because he is afraid of him and tells God she wants to know who Regan Asura is. Meanwhile, Wukong tells the players that he'll play Russian roulette with them and explains that there are three bullets in the gun, which they have to point to their heads and shoot. If there is a bullet in the chamber, they'll die and play until only one person is left. When Yun asks if this game is entirely based on chance, Wukong says that's right and tells Yun to start the game. Yun takes the gun, but Ryan tells him to wait and take a second to think because there has to be another way. Yun says playing a death game entirely based on chance doesn't surprise him at all, and he immediately shoots by putting a gun on his head. It was a blank shot. Yun felt relaxed and gave the gun to the strongest guy, but suddenly the girl said this was unfair and asked wasn't the god game about choosing the strongest winner. She asks why Wukong will choose a game dependent on luck to choose his champion, to which Wukong replies it's entertaining, which makes the girl furious. The strongest guy shoots himself, but again, it is a blank shot, so he gives the gun to the girl. Yun tells Ryan not to look so worried because they are getting out of there. It's the girl's turn to try his luck, but she is scared and Wukong tells her to stop stalling time. Otherwise, he'll kill her himself. Suddenly, Ryan realizes unlike other rounds, there is no timer for this round, and for some reason, Wukong is not calling this the fourth round. Ryan remembers after the first round, they were sent to the waiting room with Yora, and for the second round, they were sent to Inio's castle, but something was off this time. Ryan wonders why they are jumping into another game after the third round and if this is an unofficial game and thinks Yun is right there may be a way for them to survive. Suddenly, the girl shoots herself, and it is not an empty shot, so she dies, and Wukong gets happy that one is down. Wukong picks up the gun covered in the girl's blood and gives it to Ryan to see how lucky Ryan is. While holding the gun, Ryan tells Wukong that the gods are very cruel, and use his divine power, which Wukong knows will let Ryan see the future, and he'll know whether the bullet is in the chamber or not. Wukong doesn't know how far Ryan can see and thinks, even if there is a bullet in there, what will Ryan do? Suddenly, Ryan asks if he can get a respin, and Wukong asks if he wants the game to be more interesting. Ryan replies isn't it interesting if the chances of death are reset every round, so Wukong agrees to a respin. Wukong knows Ryan has foreseen a bullet in the chamber, and his chances of survival are higher after a spin. But this way, it's more entertaining, so he gives the gun to Ryan after a spin. Suddenly, Ryan points the gun at Yun, and Yun says it looks like Ryan's eyes can see more. The strongest contestant asks Wukong if this is not against the rules, and if he is not going to stop this, Ryan replies why would Wukong do that because this is not a god game. Ryan knows it's Wukong's game, and all he cares about is being entertained. So Yun gets to know it is not an unofficial round and says dying in an unofficial game is a terrible way to go. Ryan was thinking the same, so he immediately pointed the gun at Wukong. And when Wukong asked Ryan if he understood what he was doing, Ryan replied he knew he was challenging a god. Ryan shoots the gun, but there is no bullet, and suddenly, the strongest guy from Inio's castle punches Wukong. Meanwhile, Yun shows his eyes to Wukong kicks him through the wall of that room, and says it feels good. The Viking says Yun and Ryan are still his enemies, but Yun tells him to lighten up because they have a god to kill. Simultaneously, on the other hand, God asks if Inio wants to know about Ryan and admits that some part of him fears Ryan because he has seen Ryan's future, and he must prevent it from becoming a reality. Inio gets terrified to hear this, and suddenly, Yura apologizes for interrupting the discussion and says the third round has ended and it seems four participants have gone missing from the god game. Meanwhile, Wukong got up and remembered Ryan aimed the gun at Yun to signal their plan and threatened Wukong to divert his attention to Ryan, which was all a distraction for their ambush. Wukong wonders when they devised that plan, but saying it doesn't matter, he plucks his weapon stick out of his hair and says they are dead. Yun says they finally get a chance to get revenge on God and hopes Ryan's eyes keep up with him. Yun runs toward Wukong, dodging his stick, and tries to punch him, but Wukong immediately escapes his punch and tries to grab Yun. Suddenly, he sees a bullet, which Ryan shot, approaching him, so he dodges it. At the same time, the Viking punches Wukong down in the stream and wonders if Wukong is gone. Wukong knows Ryan's power lets him see the future, so he first decides to target Ryan and try to attack Ryan from behind. But Ryan sits down, dodging Wukong's stick and Yun kicks Wukong into a wall. Ryan tells Yun that if they want to get out of there alive, they need to be transparent, and he doesn't know if the Vikings will cooperate, but they need to stick together. Ryan says he knows everyone hides their powers in this game, 
but he'll do whatever it takes to get out of there alive. Meanwhile, Wukong gets up, and ri -Yin tells Yun that they can win if they understand each other's abilities, so he decides to tell Yun a secret about his power. ri -Yin tells them his divine power is omniscience, which allows him to see up to 15 seconds into the future, but naturally, his knowing the future changes it as well. Rian says if because he knows the future, he acts differently, the future will change, and if he pointed the pistol at Yun and fired, he saw that outcome. Rian also saw the outcome if he fired himself. In other words, his eyes could see any path in the future that he wanted. When Wukong sees Yun and Rian talking, he wonders what they are scheming. Meanwhile, Yun tells Rian that they got lucky with their powers, and Rian says he guessed so. But suddenly Vidar slaps Rian's head and tells him to stop screwing around because they are in the middle of a battle. When Rian asks if Vidar will follow his lead, he refuses, and Yun says it doesn't surprise him. Rian thinks if Vidar doesn't listen to him, then any future where he can change Vidar's movements is not accessible, so then it's up to him and Yun. Yun tells Rian to warn him if anything bad is about to happen. Suddenly, Wukong gets mad at them for challenging a god and uses a binding spell that captures the Vidar. Rian and Yun simultaneously start attacking Wukong, but he dodges their attacks with his stick. When Rian passes the gun to Yun, Yun feels he cannot keep it because Wukong is about to punch him, but Rian pushes Yun away. They both fall to the ground, and after transforming into a giant elephant, Wukong jumps on them, but Yun escapes with Rian. Wukong returns to his original form, and Yun feels he can't keep up with the Monkey King, so he agrees with Rian that they shouldn't be holding back. Yun decides to show his power, so he removes his glasses to show what he can do and summons his divine power, Twin Storm. Wukong recognizes the storm gods, Raijin and Fujin, and when Rian says he can back Yun up, Yun tells Rian not to bother because Rian can't keep up. Wukong says Yun's speed is nothing to brag about, but suddenly, Yun gets near him and kicks his jaw, making Wukong wonder how Yun achieved this speed. Yun throws Wukong a strong punch with a speed eight times greater than before that even Rian's eyes can't follow his movements. Yun continues bashing Wukong and is going to punch him from the back but suddenly Wukong notices him. Wukong tries to hit Yun with his stick, but Yun jumps in the air and hits Wukong with a flying kick. Yun uses his power, and with intense lighting, he hits Wukong, making Rian wonder what insane power Yun has. Rian is shocked to see Yun's true strength, but suddenly, Wukong gets up unaffected and says Yun is strong, but he has to hit a lot harder if he wants to kill a god. Wukong says for a mortal, Yun is the most impressive he has seen and says perhaps he needs to step it up. Wukong says he heard in Yun's entire existence only one person had landed a blow on him, and suddenly, he slams his face on the ground, saying he is the second. Yun remembers he lived his life as an abomination, and kids used to make fun of his face because of the scar around his eye, but he didn't regret looking this way. Yun made a resolution that would define the rest of his life so that no one would ever hurt him again, and when he grew up, he took revenge on the kids who made fun of him in childhood. Yun never let the words penetrate his spirit and decided that in a world of strong and weak, he'd stand on top of it all, and no one would hurt him because, in childhood, someone burned his face with iron. Earlier in the round 3 cave, Kayla told their third participant, a kid, that something was weird about Yun, but the kid replied he didn't know Yun well. Kayla told the kid that Yun's eyes changed to a new color when they were fighting with the opponents. Now, when Yun is fighting with Wukong, his eye color changes again, and suddenly, a huge blast happens. Rian is shocked that Yun is fine, and the blast throws Wukong away. Wukong is still fine after the explosion and says it seems there is still more to Yun, to which Yun replies he spent a lifetime being untouchable because of a promise he made to himself, but then Wukong messed it up. Yun wears his glasses and asks Wukong how many gods he thinks sponsored Yun. But after hearing this, Wukong is shocked that more gods other than Raijin and Fujin have sponsored Yun. Yun tells Wukong not to worry because he'll tell him, and when he says nine gods sponsored him, Wukong is shocked to hear this. Yun says to be undefeated in life and death, he is the best candidate to win the god game, but he doesn't care about that. The reason he is in this game is that he is looking for someone, and that is his father because he wants to murder him. Yun will not let Wukong get in his way, so before he kills him, he asks a last question. What color are his eyes? Yun attacks Wukong with the Lord of Nile power, ties him with the divine power of Gaia, and attacks with drums of Raiden, which give a horrifying electric shock to Wukong. Wukong realizes with power like this, Yun stands on the same level as actual gods. Wukong decides to retaliate, jumps up from the direction of the attack, plucks his hair, and converts them into his clones by blowing them. 
Regan notices these clones are different from Heightens, and these are not illusions. Yun uses his divine power, Dante's Inferno, which burns some clones, and when one clone tries to punch him from behind, Yun dodges it. Yun says he doesn't care about the clones because he only wants to kill Wukong, and while dodging the clones, he aims at Wukong and punches him, but Wukong also punches him away. Wukong says he doesn't remember the last time he bled like this, and when Yun tries to attack again, Ri-Yin stops him because they need to strategize, but Yun says his promise was broken because of Wukong, so he is going to be the one to kill him. Yun decides to fight again, but Ri-Yin is worried because Yun is not thinking straight, so to win, he needs to find a way to use Vidar. Ri-Yin wonders what path in the future will let him do that, and suddenly, he points the gun at Vidar. When he asks what Ri-Yin is trying to do, he replies he is choosing the right future and shoots the lock that ties Vidar. This breaks Wukong's spell, which frees the Vidar, and he asks how Ri-Yin knew it would work. Ri-Yin says he remembered earlier Wukong's attention followed the gun, and why would a god be concerned about a regular pistol and dodge its bullet? So Ri-Yin foresaw a future where he used it to free the strongest guy and chose that path. Vidar says perhaps Ri-Yin is not as useless as he thought. But Wukong says it doesn't matter if they freed Vidar because they used all three bullets. Wukong creates over 50 clones of him. So Ri-Yin tells Yun to stop reacting and wait because they'll see who Vidar truly is. Vidar uses his divine power, Hands of God, which creates a strong blast that blows all the clones in a single shot. Ri-Yin and Yun get shocked, and Ri-Yin understands why Shinjin said Vidar is the strongest and champion of God, the deity of vengeance. Yun realizes Vidar is God's candidate. But Ri-Yin thinks it's not just that and remembers when he asked C.H. Tulhu what he is doing in the god game because C.H. Tulhu was also a god. C.H. Tulhu replied who told Ri-Yin that god can't play the game. Ri-Yin is sure that Vidar is a deity, too. But when Yun says it's unfair, Vidar tells him to shut up because it's not over yet. Wukong says they have put him in quite a spot and says from a Norse divinity of vengeance with God as his sponsor, a nearly untouchable champion with nine divine powers, and an annoying participant who can see the future, he was excited to choose one of them as his champion. But now he can't wait to slaughter them all. Ri-Yin tells Yun and Vidar that he has an idea of how to kill Wukong, but he needs both of them to cooperate. And when Vidar agrees, both of them get shocked. Ri-Yin tells them to follow his lead, and by looking at the room where the girl's dead body is lying, he says he'll ensure they all get out of there. But Wukong says they'll see about that. Wukong expands his stick and attacks Vidar, but Vidar stops the stick with his hands. And meanwhile, when Yun tries to blow Wukong, Wukong dodges his attack. Simultaneously, Ri-Yin tries to stab with his glaive. But Wukong blocks it with his stick, so Ri-Yin and Yun immediately move back to give Vidar space to hit Wukong. Vidar immediately punches Wukong, which makes him spew blood, his ribs crack, and he falls far away. Yun thinks they got Wukong, and Ri-Yin tells them to keep barraging him with attacks so an opening will come. Ri-Yin believes if they don't defeat him now, all of them are finished, and suddenly, Wukong immediately comes back and furiously strikes Vidar with his stick. But when Vidar blocks it, Wukong kicks him in the stomach. Yun tries to attack, but Wukong hits his arm with his stick and slams him on the ground. Meanwhile, when Ri-Yin sees the path of opportunity to kill and points the gun at Wukong, Wukong says he knew Ri-Yin was waiting for this opportunity. Wukong swiftly moves to kick Ri-Yin and asks what he is going to do with this empty gun. Wukong kicks Ri-Yin away, and the gun falls from Ri-Yin's hand near the room's wall in which they were earlier. Wukong says he should kill Ri-Yin first because he is a fearless puppeteer who uses his foresight to orchestrate his companions into executing his plans. Wukong says it seems like Ri-Yin's eyes could not see this far, but Ri-Yin asks if Wukong knows the key thing about puppeteers, they are not the ones in the spotlight. Suddenly, someone fires the shot, and it hits through Wukong's chest. A while ago, the girl who was dead in the room had the divine power of death, and his sponsor told her to give him as many chances to win the game as she wanted, but she had to stay strong. When Ri-Yin and others were fighting with Wukong, she used her divine power to get a second chance and woke up and saw others fighting against Wukong. She took out the bullet from her head loaded in the gun, which fell from Ri-Yin's hand and, while thinking she would be the first human to kill the god, shoots Wukong. Wukong is shocked, and Ri-Yin says it is the future he saw, so Wukong understands Ri-Yin forced him to disarm him to get the pistol over to the girl. Ri-Yin says he is right because he knows the only way to kill Wukong is with the gun. After all, the bullets that Wukong gave them had to be powerful enough to kill another god, Vidar. 
3 and says he wasted the other bullets to confirm that they were not ordinary and could destroy the power of even the gods. When Wukong asks how Rian could have known about the girl's divine power, Rian says his divine power is omniscience, which lets him glance into the path of any future he wants. Rian says back when they were playing Russian roulette, he glimpsed into multiple futures, and he was lucky that he saw one where he checked to see if she was alive, and that's why he yelled that if they don't defeat Wukong now, all of them are finished, hoping the words would scare her into waking up. Wukong, while getting up, says everything played out as Rian planned, but they should have aimed for the head and run to attack again. Yun says this is best because they get to deliver the finishing blow, and suddenly, the other deities appear there and capture Wukong. God appears and says he is disappointed in Wukong and asks if he thought God would not know about this. God says despite Wukong's disobedience, he gave Wukong another chance, but his patience has run dry. Since Wukong's inception, he strived for freedom, and after being bound for so long, he wanted to break free and live his immortal life on his terms. For that, he continued fighting, and when he thought he had achieved freedom, his warden arrived, the god. One day, a new divine presence appeared out of nowhere and conquered the pantheons, and even immortal gods were enslaved to him. Wukong often wonders why he fought because, in the end, nothing changed, and he is still a prisoner of God. God says after centuries of leniency, he has grown tired of trying to tame Wukong. Meanwhile, Rian thinks it's odd because, for some reason, he can't see God's future. Simultaneously, a deity asks Vidar how the game is, and he must be desperate allying himself with mortals, but Vidar tells him to shut up. Suddenly, Yora asks God if he should transport the contestants while God handles the situation. But God stops him from doing so because he wants the contestants to watch what happens when someone opposes him. God summons Wukong's friends, who ask Wukong how they got there, but Wukong is shocked to see them and begs God to stop. Wukong begs that his friends have not done anything wrong, but God blows their heads just by moving his hand. The contestants are shocked, and God says he didn't want to do this, but time and time again, Wukong rebelled and finally forced God's hand. God says their deaths are Wukong's fault and divine or mortal. All lives belong to God, and he can take them whenever he wants. Rian and Yun are shocked at how God killed other gods so easily, but Vidar says immortality can't protect them from another divinity's power and gods can kill gods but this god's power is unlike anything they have witnessed before. Wukong says he just wanted freedom, and while asking why god has to do this, Wukong runs to escape, but Master Bolt attacks him with his bolt, which, shockingly, Wukong catches and throws back at the Master of Bolt. A blast happens, so the other gods attack Wukong immediately, but he creates his clones to fight them and says all of them are nothing but god's enslaved people. Wukong asks them how long they'll let God rule over them and says their pantheons ruled the heavens peacefully before this God's arrival. Wukong says they are gods, yet they grovel before one like worshippers, but he has had enough and says he'll eradicate the God from history today. Suddenly, God tells Yora to take the contestants to the waiting room, and Yora immediately understands. Yun tries to act, but Rian stops him, and Yora tells them it's time to go, so with a snap, he transfers them to the waiting room and tells them to rest there and await further instructions. After their transportation, God says it's a shame because he enjoyed this realm, but he tells Yora to remove the other deities as well because, unfortunately, Wukong must be erased. Yora, while teleporting himself with other deities, tells God to try not to destroy other realms in the process. Wukong says God is giving him the duel he always wanted and that God made a big mistake by calling away his peons because who will stop him now? Wukong says ever since God appeared, he dreamed of this chance to do what other gods won't. The day he opposes God's unruly presence and brings balance back to heaven, Wukong transforms. On the other hand, Rian wonders where they are, and Yun is glad because they kept them together this time. Yun asks Rian why he stopped him back there and says he gets that Wukong is their enemy, but he seems to be a prisoner of God. Rian replies he stopped Yun because they cannot do anything, and when Yun asks what they do about this girl, she plays dead the whole time to save herself. Yun asks if they are going to trust her or if they should save time and get rid of her. The girl replies they can trust her because she helped them defeat Wukong and pretended to be dead because they never could have caught Wukong off guard. When Rian asks if Vidar thinks they can trust her, Vidar replies if her sponsor is dead and she has multiple lives, she could be helpful but he doubts she is trustworthy. Rian says they are all just stressed from earlier, so he asks her name, and she replies it's Ia, and Rian says it's nice to meet her. Rian thanks her for helping them and hopes to get through this game together, but as they shake hands, Ia feels an intense energy from Rian. Suddenly, Rian notices the waiting room for the next round, 
and they all head over to take a break. Meanwhile, when Ia asks Rian about the energy she felt from him, Rian replies it was a warning and says he sees through her facade, so it won't work on him because he can see her future. While entering the waiting room, Rian says he knows her type, betraying others' trust when it benefits her, but asks her why she plays solo as the god game is dangerous. Rian tells Ia that with every round, teamwork becomes essential, and she'll never get far on her own. Suddenly, they all see their teammates in the waiting room, and they are happy to see each other. Era starts crying with joy and excitedly hugs Rian, saying she thought Wukong separated them or he did something to Rian. Rian tells Era not to worry because he is okay and is glad they are fine. When Shinjin asks Rian what happened to him, Rian replies it's a long story, and Shinjin thinks Rian seems different, but Rian thinks it's funny and wonders what Shinjin thinks has changed. But first, he says he wants to introduce them to his new friends. On the other hand, God is beating Wukong and asks if this is all the infamous Monkey King can muster or if the tiny mortals injure him too severely. Wukong expands his stick and tries to hit God, but God stops it with his power and destroys Wukong's clones. Suddenly, a clone from behind punches God and it breaks God's mask. Wukong says he was not fighting those kids seriously. He only wanted to interact with Rian. Wukong says anyone who crosses paths with Rian can escape God's all-seeing eyes and says he knew God would come after him. But without God's omniscience, Wukong thinks he has a chance. Suddenly, God appears from the dust and says it seems the Buddha was right. For a primate, Wukong is witty. Wukong is shocked to see God is fine. And when God pushes Wukong down with sheer force, Wukong can't believe this force. Suddenly, Wukong sees a hand coming towards him but he realizes it's not God's, it's of Buddha. God says the only power capable of sealing Wukong is Buddha's, and he grabs Wukong in his fist. Wukong can't understand how God got Buddha's power because Buddha never gave it to someone like God. Wukong frees himself from the fist and says it doesn't matter how many gods grovel before the god or how strong he becomes, he stands by his word and rejects his divine power. God says he'll erase Wukong from history and, with Buddha's hand, tries to smash Wukong. But Wukong tries to resist and says he and his friends will be free, if not today, then in the next life. God is shocked to see Wukong lifting Buddha's hand up, and Wukong says he declares to sponsor and bestow his divine power upon a new champion, Rian Asura. God gets mad that Wukong chose Rian as his champion, but when Wukong says he doesn't regret it, the hand pushes him into the earth, and the lava burns his legs. Meanwhile, Wukong thinks about his exhilarating life, even in his last moments, He'll fight for the freedom he had always sought and says if there is anyone who can finally achieve it, it is Rian. God destroys Wukong and his realm with Buddha's hand, and on the other hand, when Era asks if Rian is okay because he is crying, he apologizes and says it's been a long day. After some time, while having food in the waiting room, Rian tells what happened to his friends, and Era cannot believe they defeated Wukong. Meanwhile, Yun tells his teammate, Jai, to show what game he is playing but Jai tells him to mind his own business. Yun gets furious and tries to snatch his game, but Jai refuses to give it to him, and Rian wonders how this kid has survived so far. Suddenly, Era says they should think about the strategy for the fourth round because they barely got by round three. When Rian asks if they know what round four is, Era replies they know, but suddenly, someone knocks at the waiting room door. Rian thinks it's unexpected, so he decides to check it, but when he opens the door, they see an EO there. When Yun asks what happened to her eye, everyone gets mad at his questions, and Inio says she expects this question from idiot Yun. Inio remembers God punished her for trying to sponsor Rian, but she doesn't want to talk about it. Rian says it's okay, but he asks why she is there. Inio replies she is there to return another memory and prepare them for the next round, for which they have two days. Inio tells them to do whatever they want with that time. And if any of them gets injured, there is a room in the house they are staying in that has healing elixirs. When Inio asks what they know about the labyrinth of Minos, they reply nothing. So she tells them there are no teams and winners in the fourth round but only survivors. Inio explains they'll all be imported into groups of one, two, or three into a maze of epic propositions within which they'll encounter trials or monsters that they must clear to progress. Inio says they may team up or proceed solo, however, the longer they stay in the maze, the harder it becomes to find the exit. When Shinjin asks how long this round will last, Inio replies it will last four days, and Rian is shocked because it's too long. Inio says that from the remaining 190,000 participants, only 1,000 will proceed to the fifth round and the remaining survivors in the labyrinth will be fed to round 4's watcher, Minotaur. 
Rian remembers Minotaur was Tauros's sponsor, and Inio says that's the briefing for round 4, and the real reason she is there is to award them all with another memory. Inio asks them if they are ready because this memory may give them another reason to live and show them another glimpse of their memory. Rian sees himself standing in front of his house, where he sees his childhood self trying to wake up his dead parents. Suddenly, he sees his sister covered in blood with a sword in her hand, dragging a soldier out of the house. Ikika goes inside and tells her brother she is near, but Rian asks why someone killed their parents, and they were just farmers who never did anything wrong. Kid Rian says Kenji was only five and asks why he had to die, but Ikika replies the world is a cruel place, and that's why they died. Ikika says if that's how the world is, maybe they have to change to fix it and says she wants Rian to hide, and if she doesn't return in five hours, he should go east and find grandma. Ikika decides to leave, and when Rian tells her not to leave him alone, she knows it doesn't make sense to him now, but one day, he'll understand. Ikika tells him to evolve and perish in this unfair world and leaves. Meanwhile, some soldiers sitting in a bar are enjoying their victory and they thank their general Taro, but she tells them not to call her that. Suddenly, a dagger hits one of the soldiers, so she dies immediately, and others are shocked to see a girl entering the door. Ikika says it only takes a moment to eradicate life, which is precious, so she asks why the general wants to live. When their leader, Daimyo, asks who Ikika is, she replies she is another one of their victims and rushes to attack him. The soldiers try to protect Daimyo and stop her, but she tears them apart with the blade. A soldier tries to shoot her with an arrow from behind, but she notices it and throws a dagger at him, which kills that soldier on the spot. Ikika keeps killing the soldiers, and Daimyo says her eyes show she is another one. Meanwhile, a soldier is about to kill Ikika from behind, but suddenly, Rian attacks that soldier and kills him with a dagger because they killed his parents. Suddenly, Ikika stops Rian from stabbing the soldier, and when she asks what he is doing there, he replies he doesn't want to be alone and wants to help her, to which she replies she knows he would come. Suddenly, Daimyo hits her head, so she faints, and a soldier captures Rian, but he tells Daimyo that if he touches his sister, he'll die. Daimyo takes Ikika's cross, and when the soldiers ask if they can kill Rian, Daimyo tells them not to kill because he'll use both of them. Daimyo asks Rian what he and his sister believe in, one god or many or perhaps in all of the pantheons existing in the ether. A week later, Rian is chained in a place crying for his sister when a guy arrives and says it's been a week, and Rian is still crying for his sister. The boy asks where his pride is and says if he is hungry, he should stop crying. The boy says the peaceful farm life Rian has been living is over, and if he wants to survive, he needs to be beneficial because right now, Rian is just a hostage that Daimyo keeps alive so he can control the prophet. When Rian asks about the prophet, the boy replies it's Ikika Asura, the divine prophet, and since Daimyo started using her, they have won every battle. The boy says rumors are that Ikika can see the future with her eyes, and when he asks Rian if it's true, Rian while eating food, says he doesn't think Ikika has that power and Ikika is just Ikika. The boy says if Rian doesn't want to live the rest of his life as a hostage, he needs to change, and Rian remembers Ikika told him they need to change. The boy offers help to make Rian useful, but when Rian asks why he wants to help, the boy replies he knows what it is like and asks if Rian is going to keep pleading for his sister or if he will let the boy hone him into something that Daimyo can use. Rian agrees, and suddenly, the memory finishes there, and Rian finds himself back in the waiting room. Inio says it seems like they all have a lot to think about, and she'll leave them with it. But Rian says God teases them with the truth, and they have to risk their lives to find out more. When Inio asks if Rian is complaining, he says she can return their memories and ask how she feels about God. When Rian says he is curious about what happened to her eye, Inio slams him into the wall. Rian says this tells him all he wants to know and asks why she is serving God if he took her eye. Rian tells Inio to give him back his memories, and he'll get revenge for both of them. Inio asks if he is threatening God and says he must be an idiot if he thinks he'll scratch God. Inio tells Rian to consider himself lucky that she doesn't kill him for these words, but Yun says she'll continue being God's lapdog and at least Wukong had the guts to fight for what he believed in. Inio furiously tells them to look at where that got Wukong and says Wukong is dead. Rian gets shocked, and Inio says that happens when they oppose God and tells them not to waste time before the next round starts. While Inio is leaving, Rian stops her and says he doesn't want her to oppose God but wants her favor. Rian says she doesn't have to lose her eye for anything, so Inio gives him one minute while Era wonders what Rian is telling her. Yun thinks out of everyone there, 
There is no one better than Regan to convince Inio to their side, and there is something about Regan. Yun says because the god game has won victor, everyone is meant to fend for themselves, but Regan has brought them all together despite that. According to Yun, if Regan convinced Vidar to be on their side, then anything is possible. And Era thinks Yun is right because when she first met Regan, he risked his life to win her trust. Era wonders what Regan will gain from bringing Inio to their side, so Vidar tells her that it's like Regan said, he wants to kill God. Era is shocked. Regan is serious about this, and Yun says the only way out of this prison is by killing their warden, and Wukong's rebellion against God gave them key information. Firstly, they know that God rules over the pantheons, meaning that everyone is underneath him, and of the many gods, there are some like Wukong that oppose him, so if they find out which deities would rebel against God, maybe there is a way to overthrow him. Yun asks Vidar that he must know some deities who are against God because he is also a god, but Vidar replies no one would ever openly admit it as Wukong did. Vidar says because of omniscience, if God sees a future when anyone rebels, he can eradicate them before it happens and says he is in the game because God wanted him dead. Vidar says Rian has outsmarted a god once, and he can do it again. Meanwhile, Shinjin remembers after the third round, he was going to kill Era because Wukong promised to sponsor him if he killed her, but he stopped because he didn't want any more betrayal and decided to win the game with his strength. After listening to Rian, Inio says his plan sounds interesting, and she'll consider it. And Rian says if she decides to take a side, then she should let him know. Rian says it's her only chance to move without God's gaze on her and says, even if it's just temporary, that now she is free. A few minutes later, when Shinjin asks how the talk with Inio goes, Rian replies he thinks she'll come around. Shinjin asks if Rian will share his plan. Rian apologizes and replies he'll not because it's a secret, so Shinjin says he doesn't care to know anyway. Meanwhile, everyone is training for the next round. And Rian knows round 4 is the biggest yet, because according to what Inio told them, it sounded like chaos. Suddenly, Vidar asks if Rian wants to spar with him because Rian's mind intrigues him, and he wants to experience it in a battle. Vidar says Shinjin seems strong enough, and Shinjin says he'll bring Vidar to his knees. Rian thinks he knows little about Shinjin's power, who has been pretty good at keeping secrets. About Vidar, Rian believes he is the strongest in raw power, and he knows Shinjin and Vidar are powerful physically but he wonders if he can keep up as he is now. Yun asks the others to place a bet on who they think will win the spar of Vidar with Rian and Shinjin. Yun thinks Vidar can take them both, and Iya also thinks Vidar's strength is god level, but Rian's specialties are his mind and eyes, which can't help him much if Vidar plows through him. Iya thinks if they win, it'll depend on how long Shinjin can keep Rian in the battle, and Yun agrees. Kayla thought Yun had faith in Rian, to which he replies he do. But without a divine power that can physically augment him, Rian depends on his teammates to win. Jai thinks Rian and Shinjin will win because Rian seems like the type of guy who always ends up on top. Vidar gets ready for the spar and tells Rian to show him the power of another god candidate. Rian tells Shinjin that Vidar's divine power is the hand of god, and he shouldn't underestimate it. Suddenly, Vidar uses his power to attack. And Yun thinks Vidar is holding back because the last time he used his power, it was 10 times stronger. Yun wonders if the attack was weaker because Vidar used less momentum or if his divine power has different conditions. Suddenly, Shinjin comes running while holding Rian's hand, and when he asks if Rian is sure about this, Rian replies he is. So Shinjin throws him with great force towards Vidar. Vidar can't understand what they are doing because Rian is completely defenseless in that position. But suddenly, he notices Shinjin is already behind him to attack him. Vidar, with a snap of his finger, pushes Shinjin away, but when he tries to punch Shinjin, Shinjin gives him a decisive blow under his jaw, making Vidar fall far. Vidar immediately gets up, and when Rian tries to stab him, Vidar grabs his glaive. Vidar asks if it is as far as Rian planned and says Rian doesn't stand a chance with his divine power against him in a contest of strength. Vidar says there are no teammates around to protect Rian and says he expected more from him. Rian thinks Vidar is right that he has depended a lot on others, and Omniscience relies on others to execute his visions for him but to progress through the god game. He needs to be able to fight on his own. Vidar punches Rian, but Rian stops his punch with his palm, which shocks everyone. Vidar can't believe this because he can feel the aura of Wukong. Shinjin wonders why Wukong chose Rian, and Vidar wonders when the Monkey King gave his power to Rian. Rian says choosing him was Wukong's final rebellion against God, and that's why he'll use Wukong's strength to blast his way to the top. Vidar furiously tells Rian not to get ahead of himself and tries to punch him, but Rian stops his fist. 
Era is shocked that Rian is keeping up with Vidar, but suddenly, Vidar uses 50% of his power to punch, but Rian dodges it. However, air pressure pushes him back, and Era gets worried for him. Vidar thinks he overdid it, and the potions should be able to revive Rian, but he is shocked to see Rian is fine. Rian says he recognizes this power, and it looks like Vidar is finally taking him seriously. Rian knows Vidar is using half of his power and is holding back like him. Vidar is shocked that Rian has not yet used his divine power. Shinjin and Era are shocked to hear it's Rian's natural strength, and Rian says if Vidar is not showing his hand, then why should he? Rian says if Vidar wants to see his divine power, he should make Rian use it. But Vidar furiously says he'll obliterate Rian with the whole planet. Suddenly, Yun removes his glasses and tells them to hold on because it's getting dangerous, and he can't let them get this rowdy without him. Vidar asks if Yun thinks it's some kind of an open invitation and tells Yun to stay outside because he'll be the one who will crush Rian. But Yun immediately moves behind Rian to kick him. Yun knows Rian's eyes can keep up with his speed, so he wonders why Rian is not acting. Suddenly, Shinjin blocks Yun's attack and protects Rian from his attack. A moment ago, when Vidar and Yun were arguing, Shinjin thought two of the strongest contestants thought of Rian as their rival, and he couldn't believe it because the Rian he knew couldn't be the winner of the god game. Shinjin wants to be the winner of the god game, so he jumps in the spar to fight Yun. When Yun asks if Shinjin is feeling left out, Shinjin replies Yun is the one who doesn't belong in this fight. Vidar tells all of them to stop and says he'll kill them, but when he is going to use God's hand, his elder brother Thor suddenly arrives there and asks if Vidar is having fun with the insects. Kayla says Vidar's brother must be a god, too, and Ia wonders why a god is coming to their waiting room. When Vidar asks what Thor is doing there, he replies he wants to pay his brother a visit, and says his father told him he saw Vidar fighting the monkey, and he didn't even say hello to their father. When Thor asks where is Vidar's manners, Vidar asks why he would acknowledge that man. Thor calls him rude and says it's no wonder Vidar is condemned to God's game. Thor initially came to talk, but whenever he sees Vidar, he wants to smash his glare into his skull. Thor takes out his hammer and tells Rian to get out of the way because the gods are talking. But Rian replies he doesn't know who Thor is and why he is crashing their training. But Vidar is with them, so Thor should get lost. Vidar gets shocked and when Rian questions Thor's way of speaking to his brother, Thor starts laughing and asks if a human will lecture him on how to speak to the family. Thor gets mad and is about to hit Rian with his hammer. But Rian says it doesn't matter if Thor is a god because he has had enough of fearing the divine. And all of them come from a world where they are invincible. But he is tired of being looked down, so decides to show why Thor will regret underestimating him. Rian uses omniscience to dodge Thor's attack, which shocks Thor, and Rian says he is glad Thor came because he'll be a perfect warm-up for the next round. Thor says Rian must be the wild card he heard so much about and blocks Rian's glaive with his hand. Thor says his father mentioned Rian as the orchestrator of Wukong's defeat and says Rian uses his eyes well. But just because he overcame one god doesn't mean he can defeat others. Vidar suggests Rian get away quickly because Thor calls the thunder lightning. But Thor says it's already too late. Rian asks Thor if he realizes that Rian is not the only one who has fought a god before. And suddenly, Yun punches Thor's jaw, and Shinjin immediately attacks Thor with his full strength. Yun says Shinjin is stronger than he looks, and when he asks if Shinjin gets him, Shinjin replies he doubts it because Thor is Aesir clan's strongest. Suddenly, Thor appears in the sky and says they are a bunch of extraordinary creatures, which makes them shocked that Thor is fine. Yun says Shinjin made Thor angry, and Rian realizes they are in trouble, but he knows he can stop Thor if he uses Wukong's power. However, Rian realizes he can't use that power now, and suddenly, Vidar steps forward and says they are interfering in his battle and says he doesn't need them, and as it's a battle between brothers, he uses all his force to attack Thor. Meanwhile, Thor also uses his hammer to attack Vidar, but suddenly, a blast happens, and everyone gets shocked to see Ia stop both of their attacks with her hands and says she can't let them kill others. Rian wonders how the hell Ia's power suddenly increased this much, and she lifts Thor's hammer with her fingers. Thor says he came to give Vidar a message that they haven't forgotten his failure, so if he wants to settle this once and for all, he should find him in the maze, and suddenly Thor leaves. Ia thinks she got serious for nothing because Thor left without fighting, but Vidar says she has already defeated Thor. On the other hand, Thor is mad about how a woman can stop two gods, and while he is thinking, suddenly Anubis and Loki arrive there. Loki asks Thor if he also got beaten by the humans, and when she asks about Vidar, Thor says he is the same. 
Loki is surprised Vidar is making it this far without teammates, but Thor, while showing the scar on his hand, says Vidar definitely has teammates now. Loki gets shocked, and Anubis says it's likely the gang that helped Vidar in defeating Wukong. Thor asks them if they volunteered for round 4, to which they reply they did, so Thor says it's perfect, and once Vidar crosses paths with them in the maze, they'll finish him once and for all. On the contrary, Kayla thinks that as Thor told Vidar to meet him in the maze, this means there will be gods in the next round, and Shinjin asks Vidar why Thor is after him. Shinjin says Thor will be hunting Vidar in the next round, but Vidar says it'll be a good thing because he'll be nowhere near Shinjin and will go in the maze alone. Shinjin hopes Thor kills Vidar but when Ia asks the reason why Thor is after Vidar because some of them died trying to protect him, Vidar yells that he never asked them to get involved. Meanwhile, Jai says it's quite evident that the three of them are hiding something. Jai says they don't know Vidar's history with Thor and the truth of why a god is in the god game. And then there is Ia. About Ia, they thought her ability was self-revival, but even then, they didn't understand the perimeters of her divine power. And clearly, there is more to her ability. Jai then asks Shinjin why Thor recognizes him, and Era remembers Shinjin also recognized Wukong when they first met Wukong, and without their memories, that shouldn't be possible. Suddenly, Vidar starts laughing and says no wonder Shinjin has that mask on, and he is hiding everything behind there. Vidar tells Shinjin that they should spill their secrets, but Shinjin tells Vidar to get out of his way. Vidar says he can tell everyone the truth, but Shinjin replies he can do whatever he wants and says he and Vidar know better than anyone that sharing shards of themselves with everyone there and connecting is all pointless. After all, they are all going to die, and after Shinjin left for the next day and a half, other participants focused on training. Shinjin went to train on his own, and Vidar never told them what Shinjin's secret was. A night before round 4, everyone was sitting together when Yun asked if Riyin was going to say something soft and sappy but Riyin said he was not. Yun says if he is going to say something, then it's the right time because this might be the last time he sees everyone together like this. Riyin says he was thinking about the game, fighting for their lives, and enjoying the past few days made him care a lot about them. Riyin doesn't want his time with them to end, and Vidar says he knows some information that might help their chances and he didn't tell them earlier because it's connected to him. But as they stood for him, he decided to repay the favor and said, as he mentioned before, that god wanted him dead, which was a part of the truth. Vidar says multiple gods and pantheons want him erased from existence, and it's true the god game is meant to entertain the divine pantheons, but its true purpose is to execute deities that no longer serve god's vision. Vidar tells them that gods that rebel or disobey, gods without meaning or belief, and gods that are simply despised by others are scheduled for execution in God's game to see if they are worthy of existing. According to Vidar, if a human defeats a deity in the God game, that human proves themselves more worthy of immortality. When Riyan asks if this game slaughters gods and creates new ones, Vidar replies he is right, and certain divinities have aligned themselves with God to protect themselves from ever being God game candidates. Vidar says Riyan and others have already met a few of them, and as Thor confirmed, he'll be present in the next round, but he is favored by God, and the Minotaur is already the facilitator, which means he is volunteering to join round 4. Vidar says in past god games, there have been instances where deities volunteered and joined rounds as mini-game facilitators or participants. Vidar has a feeling that Thor won't be the only god joining round 4, and Era understands that the next round is not about pinning candidates against each other like other rounds because god wants them to face god. Vidar says it's his guess and they'll find out more tomorrow, and he is telling them all this is because of the thing that Yun said earlier. Vidar knows the gods that want him dead and they'll try to hunt all of them down, too, so he doesn't want their deaths on his conscience, so he tells them to better not die tomorrow. Suddenly, Yun says the big guy has emotions, and Riyan thanks Vidar and says tomorrow they'll all be ready, so no matter what happens, they'll survive and will meet each other on the other side. In the morning, they are all ready for the next round, and Yora says they look well-dressed and asks them who wants to go first. Yora says they'll be porting into the maze in four different groups, and the maximum per group is three contestants. Yora tells them that Team 1 consists of Rian and Era. Team 2 has Yun, Kayla, and Jai. Team 3 has Vidar and Ia. Vidar tells Ia to team up with someone else, but Ia says she figured it might be best for her to enter with someone strong. Yora says Team 4 has Shinjin, and Shinjin tells Yora not to waste any more time, so Yora tells them to step forward and begins round 4. Riyan tells everyone to remember what they talked about last night, that they shouldn't bother searching for each other in the maze and should rush towards the finish line, so they'll meet again on the other side. 
the team start entering the maze, and despite Rian's brave words, he knows he might not see some of those faces again. As they enter the maze, Rian asks Era if she is fine, but she is shocked to see the maze, and Rian also feels confused by its first look. Rian says it reminds him of the first round, and in that white world, everything seemed to span infinitely. Era says they have four days to find the exit, and it's not that long, considering how massive the maze seems. When Era asks if Rian thinks everyone will be okay, Rian replies they can only hope, but right now, they need to focus on surviving themselves. Suddenly, they see two paths, and when Era asks to split, Rian tells her to give him a second. Rian uses omniscience to see if they progress down one of the ways there is a trap but they can bypass it pretty easily. When Era asks what'll happen if they go straight, Rian replies it's supposedly a shortcut, but there is something dangerous in that path. They don't know that Hermes, the Olympian god, is waiting for them on that path. When Era asks what Rian wants to do, Rian reminds her that Enio told them their objective should be to find the exit as soon as possible, and if they take the easy way out, they can avoid facing that god, but it might mean they'll take the longer path that could stray from the exit. Rian says his omniscience can't see that far into the future, and he doesn't know what's beyond the trap. Era understands by Rian's look that he wants to fight God on the path straight forward. But Rian says he doesn't want to fight, he wants to obliterate them. After taking the straight path, they reach the place where Hermes is waiting, and Hermes says he was starting to wonder when they could start the game. Hermes tells them his name and says he is the divine messenger of Olympus. Hermes says he is lucky to get Rian and Era in his game because he saw their match in round 3 and says it was one of the most entertaining ones. When Rian asks what they are going to do there, Hermes asks why he is in a rush and tells them that round 4 takes place in the labyrinth, a massive maze that could take centuries to navigate, so to make it easier for the players, they added mini-games. Hermes says if they win the mini-game, they'll get a shortcut that is guaranteed to lead them in the direction of the exit, but if they lose, they'll die. Hermes says the game they'll be playing is tag and they'll take turns in rounds, interchanging between chasers and runners. The chaser has to tag every member of the opposing team before the time limit is up to win the game. But if they fail, the role switches, and runners become the chasers, and the game continues until there is a winner. Hermes explains that to tag someone, they need to hit the marking on the target's back or chest. And when he asks if they have any questions, Era asks if Hermes has to tag both Rian and Era to win. But they have only to tag him. Hermes replies she is right and takes them to a forest where they'll play. Era wonders how an environment this big fits in the maze, and Hermes says it's the god game. Hermes tells them that they use spatial manipulation to create larger environments for their mini game rooms, but no one would be able to see or access this forest unless they entered this room in the maze. Hermes says what might seem like miles upon miles for them is actually packed into a small room that's only a few meters long and wide. When Rian asks why Hermes volunteered to become a facilitator for round 4, Hermes gets startled, but then he asks if Vidar told Rian about that and says if Rian beats him, he'll answer his question because there is no point in him spilling the secrets to a couple of dead bodies anyways. Suddenly, Hermes says he forgot that two god game contestants are not enough to catch him, so to make it fairer, they'll be teaming up with the duo that arrived before them and says he believes Rian knows one of them. Suddenly, two participants appear, and they ask Hermes what the holdup is for and if they should get the game going already. When Era asks if Rian knows these guys, Rian replies he knows one of them and that he remembers the guy from the memory Enio showed him earlier. When Rian tells the guy that he is the one whom he saw in his memory, suddenly, Aki shakes hands with Rian and says it's good to see an old friend and that he didn't think he would cross paths so soon. Aki introduces his partner, Jack, and says they have been partners since the second round. Jack says Aki doesn't seem the type to have friends, so Aki replies that he and Rian crossed paths when they were kids. Suddenly, Hermes interrupts them and says they'll have plenty of time to catch up if they beat him. The players are going to start off as chasers, so Rian asks others if they have any idea how they are going to catch Hermes in that big place. Aki says there is a 30-minute timer for each round, and that's not enough time to traverse the whole forest. Aki suggests splitting into two groups and whoever finds the god will make noise so the second team can come to support. Aki tells Rian that if he is the same Rian as before, he can trust him to handle himself, and Rian replies Aki can trust him. Aki and Jack split with Rian, and while leaving, Aki says they should crush this god and get over with it. Era thinks Aki seems insane, and Rian says he seemed that way when they were kids, too. Era asks if he is someone from Rian's past. Rian tells her that Aki saved him when his sister and he got imprisoned by Daimyo. Suddenly, Hermes appears there, 
and when Regan asks what he is doing there, Hermes says just because they are chasers doesn't mean he has to hide from them. Hermes says spending the whole time hiding from a couple of weaklings is a waste of energy, and he is hosting this game so he can have some fun. Besides, it wouldn't matter if he was standing right in front of them. Suddenly, he stands in front of Rian and says they can't catch him anyway, and that's how big the gap between them is. Era tries to shoot Hermes, but he dodges the shot, and when Rian tries to stab him, he easily escapes it. Rian thinks Hermes might be fast, but he can't dodge mid-air, so Era shoots him again, but he dodges it and says he always knew they would be fun to play with. Rian is shocked to see Hermes's shoes create a foothold in the air, and after sitting on a branch of a tree, Hermes says he commends their fast teamwork that they didn't even take a second to sync up. Hermes says it's going to take a lot more than a quick attack to take him down, but suddenly, Era takes out her flicker and shoots him, but he dodges it again. Hermes says these bullets aren't fast enough to catch him, but suddenly, Era turns the bullet towards him and uses scintillate to shoot quickly. Hermes barely dodges the bullet and says she is full of surprises. Era creates a bullet storm, and Hermes understands with a red pistol, she can alter the speed of projectiles. With the blue one, she can adjust its trajectory, and together, these bullets are alive. Hermes starts to dodge the bullets while jumping from one branch to another, and Rian thinks Era's power is insane but is not strong enough to catch a god. Hermes jumps in the air, and as the bullets are following him, he creates a hold and immediately rushes towards Era while dodging the bullets. Era continues to shoot, but he dodges the bullets, reaches her, and is going to grab her head, but suddenly Rian attacks him with his glaive. Hermes immediately moves back. But his face is scratched, and he says he should have learned something from Rian's battle against Wukong. Hermes says omniscience is the ultimate counter to speed and says if Rian's eyes can see where he is before he even gets there, he will move faster than any future Rian will see. Hermes says they almost got him there, but to tag him, the tag has to be intentional direct body-on-body -body contact because weapons, divine power, and skimming don't count. When Era says he is telling them this now, Hermes replies technically, those are the same rules in the traditional tag, but here, he did give them a handicap. Hermes says they probably noticed he doesn't have the same tag markings as them, which means they can tag him anywhere on the body. Suddenly, Hermes runs toward them while thinking that Rian strikes where he'll be in the future, and that's why he can keep up. Hermes thinks it's a joke that a mortal can keep up with him and says it doesn't matter if Rian knows where he is going to be because he'll always be the fastest. Rian tries to stab Hermes. But Hermes dodges his attack, and Rian gets shocked because the future has changed. Hermes says ever since he was born, he is the fastest among the Olympians, not just in body but also in mind. Rian tries to stab him again, but he dodges it and says it doesn't matter how far Rian can see if his body and mind can't keep up. Hermes punches Rian, and Rian can't believe Hermes adapted to omniscience in a split instant. Rian remembers he saw the path of opportunity, which means there was a chance to strike Hermes, but knowing and reacting to the future changes the future as well. Rian thinks his mind is still thinking and reacting on a different plane than Hermes's, which means Hermes can adjust to the new future before Rian can. Suddenly, Era starts shooting Hermes again, but he immediately grabs her arms and asks if she is getting frustrated. Hermes says they'll never tag him with a speed like that and punches her with a decisive blow, and she gets severely wounded. Suddenly, Aki appears there and tries to attack Hermes, but he dodges his attack and thinks Aki appeared out of nowhere. Aki realizes Hermes's reactions are too fast, so he asks Jack if he is up, and Jake tells him not to worry because he got this. Jake uses his divine power, ancient pantomime, and contains Hermes. Hermes recognizes that divine power is of the god of wine and entertainment, Dionysus, the Olympian. Aki appreciates Jack's work and says they should get over with this because he was never a fan of this children's game. Aki rushes to attack Hermes, but he gets himself free and Jack is shocked that Hermes vibrates his body fast enough to break through his divine power. Aki tells Jack to stop acting surprised, and while saying weak gods shouldn't exist, he is going to hit Hermes, but Hermes runs away. Aki tells Jack to go after Hermes, but when Jack says he cannot catch him, Aki furiously tells him to go, so Jack says he knows the best and goes after Hermes. He can't believe Rian chose Era as her partner as she went down with one blow, and says it's pathetic. He says the Rian he remembers wouldn't keep someone this fragile stand before him, and he must see some value in her to have kept her around until round four, so he yells at Era to show them what she can do already. Era wonders if this is all she has got and remembers how everyone grew stronger with each round and thinks she thought this was her all strength. 
but none of it is enough. Era thinks if she wants to compete in this world of gods and monsters, she needs to envision the impossible and reach beyond. Aki says this is what they need and when one masters their divine power, they unlock access to a new tier of their sponsor's strength. After training vigorously, watching her friends grow in power, and constantly fighting for her life, it was only natural that it was Era's time as well to evolve. Era picks up her guns and gets up with an energy that her divine power upgrades to level 2, Eternity Piercer. Era loads her upgraded gun and as she shoots with it, suddenly, Hermes notices the bullets keeping up with him, and they are faster than before. Hermes notices the bullets are more persistent, and as he continues to escape them, he wonders how far they are going to follow him because he has already lapped the forest five times. Meanwhile, Jack also arrives there and attacks Hermes with invisible bombs. Simultaneously, Era falls because of her wounds, and Aki says she did a good job and takes it from there. Meanwhile, Hermes, while falling down, wonders when they set up this trap against him and remembers while he was distracted with Era, he got caught. In the meantime, Rian appears there to attack Hermes from above while Aki and Jack are covering the other side. Hermes is mad that they tricked him because he thinks he is the wittiest and fastest, so he immediately gets a hold of himself and avoids falling with his footholds. Rian notices Hermes' speed is changing the future again, and suddenly, Hermes jumps up in the air and shoots down with his arrow, which hits Rian. Aki tells Jack to be careful because Hermes is above them, but Hermes immediately jumps down at him. Hermes is going to stab Aki, but suddenly, the round ends with a bell, and Hermes says Aki is lucky. Hermes, while leaving, says he'll see them in the next round, and meanwhile, Rian heals and says he thought he was going to die. Suddenly, Jack asks Aki where he is going, and Aki says he is going back to the starting area as the next round is about to begin, and this time, Hermes will be hunting them. Jack wonders how they are going to outrun Hermes because if he catches them all in this round, they are all dead. Rian thinks they definitely pushed Hermes to the edge because he is using his maximum speed, and he has drawn his weapon. Rian thinks there has to be a way to survive the next round, but he can't find a future where he can outsmart him. Jack asks if Rian's divine power doesn't work on Hermes. Rian replies it doesn't because his omniscience lets him see the future, but inherently, the future changes because he acts on it, and Hermes is able to react to the new future faster than he can. Era says it's the same with her, and even with all her output, none of her bullets can reach Hermes. Jack screams that they are going to let Hermes tag them and begs Rian that they can't die because he has too much to live for. Rian is sure they'll figure out something together, and Aki tells the three of them to figure out how to tag Hermes in the following rounds and tells them to leave the rest to him. Aki says he'll make sure they don't lose, and when Rian asks how he is going to do that, Aki tells Rian to use his eyes to find out and leaves. The timer starts, and they all take their positions because they can hear Hermes coming. While rushing towards them, Hermes says they really made him furious during this game, and he is going to end this now. Rian alerts them that Hermes has almost arrived, and suddenly, in a split second, Hermes tags Jack. Meanwhile, Era shoots Hermes but he smoothly dodges her attack, gets near her, and says even with that new power-up of hers, she is still useless and slams her face on the ground. Hermes tags her from the back and tells Rian that his omniscience doesn't work on him, but he hears that Wukong made Rian his champion before he died. Hermes asks if Rian is really in a position to be holding back against him or if there is some kind of condition that prevents him from using that power. Hermes says he doesn't care about either and tries to attack Rian, but Rian immediately attacks with his glaive. Hermes avoids the attack, but suddenly, when Rian swiftly moves his glaive again, Hermes sits down to avoid it and gets shocked that Rian is adapting to his speed. Hermes moves behind Rian, and Rian immediately turns towards him, making Hermes realize that he has not gotten faster, but he is using his foresight to predict where he'll be. Hermes thinks that a few seconds into the future, Rian still trails behind his speed, but if Rian uses that future and knows that he'll act accordingly, he can predict how Hermes will move. Hermes knows this gets Rian closer to his future, but not exactly there, so he immediately starts changing his positions and suddenly tags Rian. Meanwhile, Aki arrives there, and Hermes asks how Aki plans to escape him, but when Aki doesn't run, Hermes asks if he gives up because he didn't even bother running. Aki asks what's the point of running when he can't outrun him, and Hermes gets happy that Aki admits it. Rian wonders how Aki is so calm because they are about to lose, and when Hermes runs to tag Aki, Rian yells at Aki to move but he is shocked to see Aki standing still. When Hermes is about to tag him, Aki says his sponsor told him the Olympians were hubristic fools. Aki says being the fastest must be great, but what good is speed without time? 
Suddenly, Hermes stops, and Rian is shocked to see Aki activate his divine power, Chorno King. Suddenly, Hermes trips down, and the round ends, but Hermes can't believe he just blacked out. The last thing Hermes remembers was he was about to tag Aki, but he couldn't reach him. Aki tells everyone to get ready because they are switching sides, and Hermes realizes Aki can control time somehow, and that is how he was able to suddenly appear earlier, but there seem to be certain conditions. Otherwise, he would have simply stopped time and tagged Hermes. Hermes thinks it's interesting and says he wonders if he can figure out the secret of overcoming Aki's divine power before they catch him. The rounds resumed, and the players pushed themselves to their limits, trying to catch Hermes. However, while Hermes could tag most of them with ease, he couldn't reach Aki, and Rian started to understand how Aki's power works. If Rian looks into the future, there are certain areas where time changes, and sometimes Aki steps into an area where time accelerates, but there are also spaces where time slows. Rian realizes Aki's divine power creates tiny pockets of space around him that if someone steps into, the flow of time changes. But there is only one pocket of space where Rian can't see the future, and that's because it's an area where time stops completely. Hermes says it's been 20 rounds of that back and forth ridiculousness and asks if Aki is going to keep hiding behind that time barrier. Aki asks if Hermes is offended and why he doesn't come over to show him. Jack says Hermes doesn't even bother tagging them anymore because he goes straight for Aki. And Rian says as long as Aki stands in that time pocket, this game of tag will go on forever until one of them catches the other. Era says right now, the only possibilities of winning are if Hermes steps into the time frozen space, and Aki tags him or if Hermes finds a way around the time frozen space to tag Aki. Rian asks if it should be possible for one of them to tag Hermes and thinks he can't just rely on Aki and Hermes to determine the future of the game so he decides to find a way to break this stalemate. Suddenly, they see Hermes leave, and Hermes is mad that of all gods, he is losing to Kronos' champion. Hermes says he decided a long time ago that there was nothing he couldn't reach and immediately turns back while saying that he is an Olympian and asks if Aki thinks he'll let him cower behind a titan's borrowed power. Hermes furiously says time is just an obstacle like anything else, and if he can break the speed of sound and light, he can conquer time. Hermes, with speed faster than light, enters the time-frozen space, and Aki says time is not something Hermes can surpass. But suddenly, Hermes enters the space and punches through Aki's chest. Hermes immediately approaches Rian to tag him. But the round finishes and Hermes says it looks like the boring bit is finally over, and after the next round, he'll kill all of them. The Titanomachy was a war between the Olympians and the Titans that lasted 10 years, but that was all before Hermes' birth. After the Titanomachy, the defeated Titans were cast into the abyss deep within the underworld known as Tartarus. The other Olympians never told him much about the war, and they claimed it was a horrific and gruesome period. However, such stories only piqued his interest, and for a place meant to house some of the most dangerous beings in the universe, security was lacking. Hermes saw God talking to Chornos, the god of Titans, who was imprisoned, and God asked if Chornos obeyed him, his eternity wouldn't be confined to the prison. Chornos said perhaps God was right, but he'd still be chained to God. God said if he was unwilling to cooperate, then one of his friends was more willing, so Chornos agreed to obey God and told him to free him. God was going to set him free but suddenly Hermes punched God and scratched his face. Hermes asks God who he is, but suddenly, he realizes it's a god, so he immediately moves away and wonders from which pantheon they are. Hermes decided to go and warn the Olympians, so he instantly ran away while wondering what kind of god would want to set Titans free. God said Hermes was fast, but God immediately appeared in front of Hermes while he was running, but he dodged the god and said he would never catch him. God said he was right, but Master Bolt could catch him, so he attacked him with a Master Bolt, which scared his face. Hermes was shocked to see his father there and when he asked why his father allowed this to happen, God replied Hermes' father had no choice but to accept peace with Titans because that's God's will and his will is law. That was the day Hermes discovered his father was a coward, and even if he refused to defend Olympus' honor, Hermes vowed that he would. But he realized, at that time, he was no better than Zeus, hosting God's little games like his lapdog and playing friends with the Titans. Hermes thinks when he finds his chance, he'll crush them all, and it'll all start with Kronos, who is sponsoring Aki. Aki cannot believe Hermes broke through time, and Regan says his trump card is gone, so the next round will decide whether they live or die. Regan knows Hermes tagging them is inevitable, and when Aki asks Regan if the time was enough for him, Regan replies it was, and there is only one way he can think of beating Hermes, so he tells them to follow his lead. On the other hand, 
Hermes wonders what's taking the players so long because it's their last round, and only two minutes are left. Suddenly, Aki appears there and tries to tag Hermes, but he dodges him and asks if their final plan is brute force. Aki uses his divine power, Chorno Slow, but Hermes immediately saves himself with his foothold from stepping into that time space and jumps outside. Hermes thinks it'll be best if he puts space between himself and Nikki, so he immediately runs from there but suddenly Jack creates a wall with sharp spikes in front of Hermes and he is going to hit it but he timely stops himself. Hermes knows Jack's pantomime allows him to generate invisible objects, but he can sense its usage because Jack uses divine power to create them. Hermes only becomes able to see those objects when he gets close to them and realizes that's why they were taking so long before attacking him because they were setting traps around the forest to prevent him from using his maximum speed. Meanwhile, Eris shoots Hermes, and he starts to run, but he knows if he runs full speed into spiked walls, he is finished, and if that doesn't kill him, Eris' bullets will. Hermes sees that's not all, and there is an entire section of the forest that is trapped to slow him, and it seems dangerous to him. Hermes thinks he could use his winged shoes to travel above the forest until the time runs out, but traveling in the air is slower than on the ground, and Era's Eternity Piercer would catch up to him. Hermes remembers the path he traveled down earlier, and thinks that area must not be trapped, but suddenly, he notices the bullets are leading him toward the direction of where he came from. Hermes thinks if it could be a part of Rian's plan and decides he wouldn't it past Rian to bait him like this. Hermes decides to do the unpredictable and go straight towards where Era is firing. Hermes knows there are only 15 seconds left and thinks they can't beat him, but suddenly, he sees Rian standing in the way he is running. And when he asks what Rian is doing there, Rian says Hermes is predictable. Hermes thinks there are three ways to get out of there, to his left, where Jack is, to his right, where Era and Aki are, and the third is in front of him, where Rian is standing, so he tells Rian that there is only one way to settle this. Hermes says Rian's friends can blame him for their defeat, but he sees Rian is not using his weapon, and Rian says he doesn't need his weapon to tag Hermes. Only four seconds are remaining, and Hermes decides to defeat God's champion first before he defeats God. Hermes dodges Rian's punch and tries to pass him, but suddenly Rian tags him with his other hand, using immense power, which causes a huge blast. Hermes says he should have known Rian had another trick up his sleeves, but now he has lost his arm. Hermes saw Rian's divine power switch from omniscience to something else in a split second. Rian used omniscience to read the future and then switched his divine power. Hermes understands the reason that Rian was reluctant to use Wukong's power is that Rian can't use omniscience in unison, and that's why he kept challenging Hermes so he would think Rian was predictable. Everyone gets shocked, but suddenly, Jack and Era start celebrating that Rian's plan worked. Hermes realizes this is why all pantheons have their eyes on Rian, and Rian is like the god he met a few years ago. Hermes sees that against all odds, they somehow find a way to cling to the thing they cherish called life. Rian asks now that they beat Hermes if he'll tell them why he volunteered for round 4. Hermes replies they host games to prove their worth to God. Some want to get on God's side, while others just like watching others suffer, so they volunteer, and everyone has their reasons. When Aki asks Hermes's reason, Hermes replies they can say he is on God's hate list at the moment, and he wants to make a good impression. Rian remembers according to Vidar, the deities that obey God are split and wonders if Hermes could oppose God, too. Rian says he knows they are being watched, and Hermes can't say much. Hermes gets shocked when Rian says divine or mortal, it doesn't matter because he is going to kill God and free everyone from this sick game. Hermes asks if he knows what he is saying because he cannot win against someone like God. The reason he watches the God game is to see human struggles, determination and the way they cling to life, and nothing makes Hermes feel alive than witnessing mortality. Rian says for folks who put in so much effort to stay alive, Hermes sure enjoys taking on suicide missions, but Hermes replies he likes idiots that dream big. Hermes asks if there is anything else they want to ask them, it's their last chance, so Rian asks if he has seen Ikika Asura. Hermes knows Rian is Ikika's brother, so he says he should have put two and two together. Era asks so he knows Ikika, and Hermes replies, of course he does, and they all do know her. When Rian asks where she is, Hermes replies that Rian knows and that in the Minotaur's great labyrinth, they'll be surprised at who they can find here. On the other hand, Shinjin asks if Euron can stop following him, but he says it's better to stick together. After all, the rest of his team died in the last mini-game. Suddenly, Shinjin tells Euron to stop, 
and they are shocked to see a lion coming towards them. But suddenly, the lion dies, and they see a girl appearing from behind the lion. Yuron asks if Shinjin knows this girl because she is wearing the same cloak as him. Shinjin thinks the only ones who have that cloak are god game victors, so he wonders who the hell this girl is. The girl takes off his cloak, and it's Ikika Asura, but Shinjin doesn't recognize her, however, she seems familiar to him. Ikika asks if the two of them are looking to join the mini-game, but the boy asks how she knows there is a mini-game ahead. Ikika gets offended by his questions and says they can keep wandering the maze themselves. Ikika says she figured that they might want a free pass to exit, and with two god game victors, winning the game should be easy. The boy can't understand what she is saying, but he gets shocked when Shinjin follows her, so he also decides to team up with them. On the other hand, Hephaestus, the Olympian god of craftsmanship, is looking at a bullet and says he has never seen anything like this, a material that can kill God, and asks Enio from where she got this. Enio remembers Rian gave her this bullet, but she tells Hephaestus that it's complicated. Hephaestus says it looks like he'll see Enio in the next God game because that's likely the punishment for asking him for a favor. Hephaestus can't believe she is foolish enough to bring him such a thing and tells her to get it out of his sight. When Enio says God cannot see him, Hephaestus shockingly asks what she means, to which Enio replies that God's champion is Ri and Asura, a candidate with omniscience. Enio says Wukong discovered that interacting with Ri Yin can make one disrupt their future and, therefore, escape God's vision. When Hephaestus asks how she knows, Enio tells him not to worry about it. Hephaestus says even if she is free from God's omniscience, it doesn't mean he also is, and what she is asking and what she is asking for will get them both killed. Enio says she has a plan, and the first possibility is that as God cannot see her future if she interacts with Hephaestus, God also cannot see his future, and the second is her freedom doesn't pass to Hephaestus, but God cannot see Enio interacted with him. Therefore, God won't know where the bullet came from. Enio says God is too busy preparing round 4 to monitor every possible thing Hephaestus forges. Enio says all she needs is for Hephaestus to lend her his skill, and she'll get out of his hair. Enio says she knows what God made Hephaestus's father do to him and asks if he is going to spend his eternity banging away with his hammer. Enio says the Olympians wine and dines and dance while Hephaestus is enslaved to this forge, building their future. Enio asks if he doesn't want to take the chance to do something, so he asks how long his freedom lasts. Enio replies she doesn't know, but this is their chance and is not sure if they'll find one like this again. Hephaestus decides to help but asks her to promise something and she says he can ask whatever he wants. After some while, Enio gives something that Hephaestus made from the bullet and tells Hermes to give it to Rian safely, and says he'll only deliver it if Rian passes his test in the god game only the strongest survive, and the champions who claim they'll overthrow god. Hermes says he'll be the one to decide if Rian is worthy of the weapon. Hermes congratulates Rian on his win, shakes hands with him, and secretly gives him that thing Hephaestus made for him. Hermes says if Rian dies to another god, that will make Hermes look bad, but Rian tells him not to worry because no one will kill him because he'll be the one to destroy the god. On the other hand, Yun and his team have to face two gods, Hui, the god of archery, and Hotter, the Aesir god of night and darkness. 